Welcome everyone. Uh, the following video is the recording of a webinar that was held on December 16, 2020, which was called for a new regulation of professional football. This webinar was uh, co-organized by myself, Jean-Michel Devel from the Université Libre of Brussels, and Jérémy Bastien from the University of Reims. The webinar was a, was a success. We had more than 200 registra registrations and one, more than 150 people attended at some point during the day. Um, it's, it was important for us to, to introduce ourselves before starting the webinar and um, I'm going to start. So um, I'm Jean-Francois Brocard. I'm an associate professor at the University of Limoges. I'm working at the CDES, Centre de Droit et d'Economie du Sport. My PhD um, was focusing on the intermediation of the labor market of professional athletes, so mainly the, the, the role of agents, and my postdoctorate uh, tackled the development of TPO, the third party ownership. I'm also the, the Secretary General of the International Association of Sports Economists and of the French seminar called uh, Disport. So my, my, the, my research focuses on the drifts and excesses of professional sports. So I was really thrilled when Jean-Michel first contacted me about this project. Um, in fact, we already had another webinar in, in, organized in French and you can find it on, on, the, on the net if you're looking for it. Uh, you can check on the website of the CDS website and you, you will easily find the way to, to watch it. But this first seminar in French and this seminar that you're gonna to watch today are just the two first steps of a bigger project, which is to develop a real alternative uh, regulation for professional football, because we really, we really think that the, the, the path of professional football is a dangerous one, the current one. So we would like to develop an alternative one. So Jean-Michel is really the pioneer of this project. So I was um, really happy when he, when he contacted me and I really would really like to thank him. Uh, so Jean-Michel, um, in front of everyone, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very happy to, to be here with you today. Uh, then I'm Jean-Michel De Waal, a professor of political science at the University uh, Free University of Brussels, but in French it's uh, Univers Université Libre de Bruxelles, the French-speaking university. Brussels, Belgium, it's a very complicated uh, country. Uh, my academic field, uh, in fact, is comparative politics. Uh, I have worked in the past uh, and published on political parties, post-communist Europe, uh, the evolution of the left in Europe, etc., etc. Uh, but I have always been interested uh, in sociology of sport, the relation between sport and politics, in the political identity of supporters. Among all the things, I co-edited the Palgrave International Handbook of, politics, or of Football and Politics uh, two or three years ago. So very sorry, uh, very sorry. I'm not a, uh, an economist. Uh, then uh, thank you very much to accept me in uh, your in your panel and to accept that a, a poor political scientist uh, uh, can discuss with uh, uh, the master of the world the economy. Uh, in Belgium, and particularly in French-speaking parts, uh, sociology of sport remains a legitimate research topic. In university, it's not uh, easy. I'm often jealous of the situation in Limoges or, or in some other UK or United States uh, or the university. For the moment, I'm working on referees, uh, which are a bit uh, a black box, and the great omission of research. Uh, if, any, if anyone uh, is interested by this topic, uh, please uh, uh, send me an email and maybe we can uh, think to uh, work together about this uh, very interesting topic from my point of view. Then uh, the idea of this day came from discussion with different persons, different people, journalists, researchers, supporters. And I defend the idea that it is not enough to denounce 
the excess of football and to say, wow, what is this football? It's bullshit. What is it? Uh, too many money. It's impossible. I don't like to denounce the football business. It's very easy to, uh, to say that. Uh, to denounce closely your project uh, or in the sense which it's very easy. But what do we have to propose ourselves? What is our vision of football? It seems to me that has in many fields, we lack a robust, solid alternative. We need to show that another way of organizing football uh, is possible. Uh, that current trends are not natural, which measure can be taken, and that another regulation of football is possible. I think it's very important to explain to people, to supporters, that it's not only one way it's possible. We can think and we can maybe propose uh, other regulation. The aim of this seminar is to work together uh, to construct proposal. We would like discussion was not, not be confined to the academic field, but that the world of football in its various components, supporter, player, manager, participate in them. If it is only to discuss uh, in the academic field, it's not very interesting. It, 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 the goal of this uh, uh, seminar is not to publish uh, one book more or one uh, special issue. We, we can do this. It, it can be very interesting. But from my point of view, it, it is not uh, the main uh, uh, objective, the main goal. Uh, I think we, we, we must to, 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 to try uh, to, to, to diffuse and to discuss with the world of uh, football. Uh, of course, there is a lot of work, a lot of research. Uh, we are not starting from scratch, uh, but the present situation with COVID, with uh, the financial crisis, et cetera, et cetera, uh, has uh, highlighted a number of weakness and questions and that we need to integrate in our thinking. Then for me and also for uh, Jeremy, for Jean-Francois, for everybody, uh, today, it is only the first step. Uh, it is uh, uh, um, I, I hope that uh, at the end of the seminar, we, we, we have time to discuss together how we can advance and uh, how we can uh, build something uh, together. Uh, thank you uh, uh, very much. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I uh, uh, give the floor uh, now uh, to uh, uh, Jeremy. Thank you, Jean-Michel, and hello, everyone. Thank you for, for your presence. Like um, Jean-Francois and, uh, and Jean-Michel, I will briefly introduce myself before saying a few words about the seminar. Uh, I am Jeremy Bastien. I am assistant professor at the University of France in France. I am sports economist in a research center called Regard and also at the CDS of the University of Limoges. I mainly work on football. I wrote a thesis on the regulation of European professional football in which I mobilized the French regulation theory. And this question of regulation also leads me to deal with the financialization of football and with the question of the crisis of European professional football. Now, I would like to mention the basic elements that motivated the setting up of this seminar. As Jean-Michel said, our objective is to reflect on how to create a more virtuous professional football in Europe, because football is distorted by four major trends. The first is the substitution of financial power for sporting power. Indeed, more and more, football funders guide the evolution of the model. To take just one example, I am thinking of moving matches for the needs of television. The second trend is the increase in sporting inequalities. 
we talk about competitive imbalance in sports economics. And this is problematic because it distorts equal opportunities for success. Indeed, the best places and trophies have been monopolized by limited number of clubs for several decades. The third trend concerns the multiplication of abuses in football. There are many examples like corruption, tax fraud, or financial opacity. The fourth trend is, I think, the most important, in particular because public opinion has been opposed to it for more decades in a complex economic and social context. And this is not going to improve with the current pandemic crisis. And these are the level and growth of wages and player trans and transfer payments. Sorry. This leads to a disconnection between players' remuneration and productivity, which also question football analysts, specialists, and stakeholders, that is to say, all of us here today, because players' remuneration is itself disconnected from the real activity of the club. Television revenues are not enough, and only a deficit management of clubs and the massive use of debt can finance players' remunerations and transfers. And what is often called the speculative bubble of football is this disconnection between players' remuneration and the real value of club. Of course, this bubble is fueled by television revenues and has an effect on the volume and value of club assets. The bursting of this speculative bubble has been predicted for decades. This has led economists to debate the existence of a financial crisis in and its duration. The bursting of this bubble seems indeed inevitable. So the question is what to do to prevent it. As the dysfunctions and excesses of football are attributed to its deregulation, European professional football should be regulated to survive. But it is not deregulated. There are regulations in football, sports, and financial regulations, for example. What is true is that some rules have been abolished. The Bosman ruling is often taken as an example in the labor market. Other rules have been replaced by less binding rules. And this is interesting because this is the hallmark of neoliberalism. So beyond regulating, it is a question of determining how to regulate well. In this perspective, some are thinking about applying the regulation of the North American Clause League in European Open Leagues. Some go further, as we will see today. There should be a close league in European professional football. All this question of regulation will be discussed during this seminar. This question will also lead us to a finer understanding of the economic model of clubs and leagues. The quality of uh, today's panel is excellent. So thank you all again for your participation. And I give the floor back to Jean-François for the practicalities of organizing the seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. It was nice to have a clear like, uh, overall presentation of the reasons why we organized this webinar and uh, the objectives of, uh, of it. So the webinar is going to be composed of three different sessions. Um, and each of them are going to be organized with two or three uh, presentations, then followed by some questions to people that were pre-selected. And then afterwards, uh, depending on how uh, the timing goes, uh, we will be able to uh, get questions from the crowd, from the audience. We have three different um, um, uh, chairs for the sessions. Uh, Didier Primo, uh, General Director of CDS, is going to chair the first session. Christophe Le Petit, the Director of uh, Economic Studies at the CDS is going to chair the second session, and I'm going to have the, the I'm going to be very proud to to chair the the afternoon session. Uh, good morning to everyone. I'm very pleased to to uh, to share this panel. Thank you for the organizer for asking me. 
and I'm also very happy to see a lot of uh, friends in this uh, very, very good, impressive uh, uh, audience. Uh, so we can start uh, directly with the first presentation. Uh, Christian Brandt from the University of uh, Beirut uh, is the first speaker. Uh, Christian, you have, you have the floor. Okay, hello everybody. And um, thank you for offering me the opportunity to start this uh, webinar, this session. And uh, well, um, I may introduce myself um, to, to understand the, the, what I'm presenting today is um, I'm already original trained as a social anthropologist. So I have a specific view and now working in the sports department. So, well, this might be helpful to understand what I'm going to present now. Uh, because today I choose a really, really specific uh, perspective from a, a specific stakeholder. Um, it has been already mentioned in the introduction of the uh, webinar that um, supporters are quite fans, supporters are quite important, and we may differ them between supporters which are more the hardcore traditional with a long-term emotional relationship and other spectators which just came to have watched some some games and socialize a little bit um, but especially these hardcore supporters they criticize the regulation of football since several years depends on which european country we are looking and uh, for example um, i just checked the supporters direct uh, website and supporters organization and they have this current campaign reforming football for the better and where they have different goals, they claim, proclaim for democracy, cooperation, solidarity, which means fair competition, as we have already heard in the introduction, and uh, the option of sustainability. Um, and well, sustainability is defined, or they define sustainability uh, as it's written over here, that they mean increasing capital in a sustainable way. Um, which is, of course, quite sounds quite nice, and probably everybody would agree that it's it's nice to be sustainable on that issue, but um, well, in detail, it's often quite complicated. Uh, and what does it really mean? And so, well, this is where my approach is going to start today. Um, as I will have a look at a specific group. Um, well, and it's difficult of the protests or a specific group of football clubs, um, um, and look how they try to organize this sustainable uh, income. And well, I will look at uh, what Adam Brown or Chris Porter called breakaway clubs. Uh, these are clubs which are founded by um, supporters which are unsatisfied with their current club. Let's keep it that simple. By the way, Green Stewart's Dykes, I saw you already here. Um, and um, these clubs are usually owned by um, the fans um like the probably most famous example united of manchester i think most of you are aware of it um after the glazer family took over the club some uh, fans decide we would find they find our own club and we have these similar clubs in different european countries and uh well in general uh, from the perspective of income um these say these clubs have an have a problem a small problem because uh first of all usually they reject some helper or overcommunization, but on the other hand, they are playing in competitive football, which in fact means um, they also need to create some money. And um, so my idea is to learn how they organize to create some money. And if there could be some regulation which could be transferred to the professional football. Um, and today I would like just because it's quite a huge topic today I'd just like to focus on one of the, one specific uh, aspect which is sponsoring ship um, because um, well it is also present at these clubs even if they are called for example by Davis the most radical response uh, to communication of the game but there is sponsoring but I would not like to start in Manchester uh, as I've done my research in Hamburg um, and uh, at a specific club named HFC Falke. Um, this club was founded in 2014 um, by disappointed uh, supporters of the HSV, the Hamburger Sportverein, the biggest club in town during that period, first division, uh, now relegated to the second one. 
Um, and they have sent off the professional teams of the club um, to a stock company and then some investors came in and some fans dislike this uh, development and found their own club. And uh, well, um, yes, this is, uh, and since 2015, they are playing in regularly competitive football. Um, so what I'm showing, currently showing is the official um, picture of the team on this, I think it's a season 2016-2017 or 2017-2018, I'm not sure. But which is important, I like to, to show you the picture to, to, um, uh, on to, uh, for two reasons. First of all, I would like to draw your attention to that guy over there. Um, and uh, as you have probably realized, uh, it's me. Um, because, well, as I said, I'm a social anthropologist, so I did some participant observation over there for 27 months. And I did, well, several um, jobs um, in the club. And why I'm on the picture is because I also became a kid manager. Uh, this is why I'm on the picture. But I also attend different meetings, like board meetings, for example, where I could um, participate in context of my research, but also on different other democratic meetings where the club negotiate uh, different issues, also negotiates issues on sponsoring, and that's why uh, this uh, is well, this is the main the main source. This how they discuss on this meeting and how they act. Uh, but also, I'm also showing this picture to due to a different reason because, as you've probably seen, there is also some sponsoring on this picture as well. I will just zoom a little bit in. Sorry for the quality, but um, well. And when we have a closer look, we can see that they are sitting on this Holstein boxes. Uh, Holstein is a local brewery from Hamburg. Some people might know them because they had been sponsor of Tottenham Hotspurs, I think, during the 90s. Um, so they belong to a huge company, belonging to Carlsberg. Um, but yes, well, if we, as we can see, they are also present here at these official um, pictures. And so, well, sponsoring is a real topic. Um, and I hope we can, and I know I'm going to present now how they discuss it, how they negotiate their, their sponsoring guidelines. And uh, we may think um, how it may help in professional football. First of all, I would like to have a look when the topic occur, um, because it was, it was presented at different debates and it was related to when they talk about founding, founding a youth team, founding a youth team when they talking about finding a known pitch, which was a critical topic. But it was also um, discussed when they talk about uh, players payment. So I related that it was also related to questions of success, which we already know um, from professional football, and was related to an international tournament, which, well, they tried to organize it never happened, but they had the idea. Uh, so th I think these four topics are probably the similar, quite similar to professional football when they're talking about infrastructure, about use, about um, players' payment or traveling. But there's another topic um, when, where, where sponsoring is used for, and it's also used for the fans. Um, this sounds probably a little bit crazy, but I will try to explain it. Um, as I already mentioned, they had to sponsor the Hudson Brewery, and this brewery gave some as part of the sponsoring deal, they gave some beer to the club. And the, so the club was able to reduct the beer prices at the matches for the fans. Um, and so this was the idea how the fans could participate in the sponsoring deal. Um, and of course, probably most of you would agree, cheap beer is a big issue at football matches, uh, even at uh, amateur level. Um, so they had for two, two seasons, they had this deal um, and they really talk, some people really talk about, okay, we'll, when we have a sponsor, we also, also it's not the community has to participate and has to benefit from it and not just the, the players or whatever. So this is something we may keep in mind, which could be all, how it could be transferred to professional football. Um, you can think about it. But they, of course, they also talk about a lot of risk and problems. First of all, the main issue was uh, they would keep their independence um, so, well, they fear to depend on one single sponsor or single investor or whatever. Um, I think most of you, it's, it's quite clear. Um, they have the fear that their fan culture would be limited. It was especially a topic when they talk about banners, where could sponsored banners be planned, uh, placed, um, because they say, well, we also need some banners for the different fan groups or something like that. 
Um, this is also something we have in professional football. And of course, uh, the main issue was um, they say, well, we would lose our identity if we, or they say the risk to lose the identity uh, when we, the sponsor has, well, is changing our identity in many ways when we present him to delight or something like this. Um, so, and, um, but during the period they had different sponsors. Um, these are the sponsors they had during my stay. Um, probably most of you know, um, as I already uh, spotlighted, the, the Holzen Brewery, um, but there are also some other companies. And um, I will explain these companies and therefore we can learn, thereby we can learn something about their, um, their rules. Um, but first of all, we should keep in mind that they are not talking officially, which is quite interesting, they're not talking officially about sponsors. They use the term supporters instead of that, or um, so because they, they know that the term was a little bit tricky, and so they, they changed it. Um, but they say, uh, well, we accept general, they accept the necessity to create sponsors or to have sponsors, but they say, well, we need a relation uh, to these sponsors. And this relation could be local. If they, for example, they say, if it is a local company, especially from the quarter, um, this would be quite nice and we would, would be, we would accept it. And for example, if we have a look here at the Holston Brewery, which was really close to the, the first football ground they had, uh, you could see the brewery. And so they say, well, this relation, it's, it belongs in a way to us because it's, it's from our quarter. A second issue is they say, well, if the, the company has a special relationship to the club, uh, we already also accept it. And this could be also done by some members. For example, um, when we look over here, um, down over here, there's a Pandora beer bar, which is a pub uh, where the club was founded. They say, well, of course they are allowed to be our sponsor because there we've been founded. Um, but on the other hand, you can see these three companies over here, um, they belong um, sometimes by Falcon members or some Falcon members work our employees of these companies. And say, so they say, well, we have a relationship it's also fine for them to be our sponsors. And the final issue is that they say, well, if they have a long-term relationship to, to football and share in a way our vision of football, it's also fine. And this is the reason, for example, here at the Erima, which is producing the, the jerseys. Um, and they say, well, it's a German company working since uh, 120 years now. Um, so they have to in tradition in football, and that's the reason why it's okay. And the sports line is also a distributor, which is, um, they say, also belongs to this category of, okay, they have an, uh, an stake in, in football, so we would accept them as our sponsors. And um, from my perspective, it is they, that they, they are able, if the companies um, match these, these requirements, they are able to build a relation to them. They can say we can continue our authenticity. Uh, they say these companies could belong to our community and therefore we could continue um, this symbolic on uh, this ownership of our club and also continue uh, our um, uh, symbolic ownership. Um, so this is how they um, legitimate their sponsors. And so now I'm just in the next step, I just try to transform this to our topic and what might it be for regulations? This is not something they had say, this is more what how I tried to, to transfer them. And when I talk about the issue of dependence, there might be just some idea to limit the influence of sponsors, which means a club needs a number of X number of sponsors or that each number just, uh, each sponsor is just allowed to give a certain piece of, of income. So it's not that much depending on one sponsor. Um, clubs or even associations might think where uh, sponsors could be present. Um, for example, which banners, which areas in a stadium should be uh, left for the fans where they can place their banners. Or uh, it also means where we present them on the website. Is it the biggest topic, um, the biggest uh, sign when I enter the homepage or is it just in the bottom or something like this? So there could be also some regulation. But I think the main issue is the uh, what I relate to identity. Uh, first of all, they, are, uh, they say that uh, the club name, the club colors, the logo should not be changed due to sponsoring reasons. 
Um, when, for example, think about uh, Salzburg, where Red Bull took over the club, changed the colors, changed the logo, and even changed the history and say, well, we deny this champion, uh, Austrian champion in the 1930s. Um, this is something they really reject uh, and which could be also transferred to some regulations. Uh, also stadium names, um, at Falke they prohibit to change uh, the stadium name if they would have a stadium in the future. So there are some symbolic, I would say that there are some symbolic cha um, symbolic um, charged um, names or places uh, which should remain, um, which could be um, safe or so rescued uh, from sponsoring and which should be um, prohibited for sponsoring to enter. Um, it's also a topic on the, on the sponsoring the jersey, have a sponsor on the jersey. Currently they don't have it as you have seen in the first picture. And they really discussed uh, if there is an opportunity in the future um, and uh, what people really say that is, okay, well, if we would one day may accept a, um, a sponsor on the old jersey, it should be in the club colors and not changing. Um, like, I don't know, you have a green, uh, green, or in this case, black and white jersey, and you have a uh, orange sponsor or whatever. So you should have the same colors. Um, yes, so this, this could be also transferred to, to some regulations. Um, we could also think about how, if these normative guidelines could be, um an issue which also sponsors spawn at other clubs should match but of course we should be aware that this is quite quite tricky uh and probably not easy just to do it in general and probably need a specific look at each club um in general there's a recommendation to think about the use of terms um should clubs really talk about customers or should clubs talk about fans, for example, but this is probably something not for regulation. And we may think, um, as I have mentioned in, with the, the Holston example, uh, we may think if there is a possibility of fans to benefit from sponsoring deals or even from television deals or whatever, so there might be some regulation that a certain amount of money or whatever certain percentage would should be related to fan issues because these fans are also something which is sold by these um, clubs because well, they, they celebrate this uh, creation. Nevertheless, of course, I'm pretty sure uh, it has some benefits if you would follow this really, really um, raw uh, regulations. Um, the supporters might be more, success, uh, more satisfied. They might some uh, might be some higher identification, and there might be also some sustainability, as I mentioned um, previous. But of course, it also has some negative impacts, which um, I would not like to hide. Um, on the short term, it means probably less income. It is probably some of these um, regulations I mentioned are probably quite uh, well, quite complicated, and it would be. Uh, really mean to to create uh, in some cases a regular monster or whatever, and it is quite and it's not clear who could or um, who should decide on it. But um, yes, so these are my findings um, from that field. And well, of course, here's some remarks. But nevertheless, I think I'm finished in time. Uh, perfectly in time. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. As uh, Jean-François explained before, we will have the discussion after the, th the three uh, different presentations. And uh, so I, I will give now the, the floor to Jean-François for his, his own presentation. Thank you, Didier. Um, a little bit late. Well, um, it's not an easy mission to, to tackle the labor market and its excesses in football in 20 minutes. Um, I'm not in, in, in a position to criticize the organization, but uh, as you may um, guess, I'm going to have to make decisions on what I'm going to tackle and what I'm not going to tackle. So uh, those decisions were pretty subjective. So, uh, but anyway. The first question I'm going to try to answer is why is the labor market so important when you analyze football? And I decided to, uh, to highlight two factors. The first one is the peculiarities of club's production function uh, compared to other companies. 
So the clubs, they produce live shows, which are actually performed by players. There's a lot of things that are done in a back office, but still, what is important takes place on the field. So as such, the labor is the main input uh, of the production function of clubs. The second factor is the fact that uh, pro football is professional football is a is a weird economic good because actually uh, clubs are co-producing live shows, the games. What is sold, in fact, is the, the combination of those games, uh, the competition, which aims at determining a champion. So um, in a nutshell, clubs are actually um, asked to compete on the field, but at the same time, they need to cooperate, economically speaking, to create this good, uh, which is eventually sold to the supporters and uh, TV, TV, etc. So the labor market outcome, its, uh, its equilibrium, determines the allocation of talent among clubs, and leagues that will determine the sporting results, uh, the quality of, of football as an economic good, and eventually its revenues. So the labor market is core in an, uh, understanding the economics of, uh, of football. Short historical perspective, uh, the retain and transfer system was initially enforced. Uh, it gave all the power to clubs as players couldn't move freely even when their contract was over. There were a couple of national moves uh, that abolished it. And then, of course, the Bosman ruling in 1995, which was the cornerstone of the deregulation of this market. In 2001, uh, the main stakeholders gathered together and created the transfer system that is still current, currently um, implemented. This uh, system has uh, five pillars, five objectives, the protection of minors, the training of young players, um, a support for the contractual stability and two mechanisms, the, a solidarity and redistribution one and a dispute resolu resolution one. Um, what, what is very important and uncommon in this transfer system is that um, a part of the players that are moving uh, are still under contract, which leads to a situation where the, the releasing clubs get a, a compensation fee from the buying club. Uh, and it's very uncommon if you compare with other sectors. So that's something that is going to be important when you, when you analyze the labor market. The two questions that I'm going to try to answer today are the following. Why should the labor market of professional football players be better regulated? Uh, what is wrong? What is bad? What is uh, um, irrelevant with the current regulation? Um, and what kind of alternative regulations could be recommended? Um, those recommendations are, are going to be um, voluntarily provocative, pretty extreme, and hopefully they're going to raise debates and questions afterwards. To answer those questions, I'm going to first uh, try to describe the main features of the labor market and its excesses, and then I, I will show you, I mean, I will suggest some, uh, some changes to the regulation. What are the main features and excesses that I'm going to describe? There's going to be five. The continuous growth of the macroeconomic figures, uh, the segmentation of the supply side, the talent concentration, which is due to the segmentation of the demand side, then the generalized intermediation and the financialization of the market. <clears throat> First, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you some stylus facts that prove that the, the, this market is continuously growing. <clears throat> the because in fact, the transfer system that was implemented in 2001 is pretty liberal and is not really binding. Two events um, uh, happen at the same time and uh, work together uh, in, in order to, to, to explain the economic boom. First, the deregulation of the labor market, so starting with Bosman, and then the liberalization of several audiovisual markets. And those two events together created this, uh, this boom. Couple uh, illustrations. Uh, um, those ones come from FIFA TMS reports, the number of international transfer, uh, the spending on transfer fees per year. Those, so those two um, variables uh, grow, <laughs> the, 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 the growth is continuous. Another other illustrations, uh, the transfer fees paid by English first division clubs and the average weekly wage in English football. So if you look from the outside, um, What's wrong? What's bad? What's the problem? Uh, why is this continuous growth not unanimously seen as a, as a positive eye? I mean, what's the problem? So I decided to, to, to focus on two, two, two elements to, to answer. First, um, this growth 
did not help reach the initial objectives of the transfer system implemented in 2001. I, I took two of the five pillars, the contractual stability uh, between 2009 and 2017, the average tenure of players in their club reached a minimum of 2.2 two, two years. That's a CES uh, fact, um, result. Other pillar, the solidarity and redistribution mechanisms, the, the figures that are given by clubs and, and reported in the FIFA TMS uh, documents is really, really low. And uh, it, 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 it's amazing how low they are. Like not, not even 1% of the fees are given to the solidarity uh, contribution mechanism and only one tenth percent of the fee is given to the training compensation is, is, is um, uh, yeah is representing represented by training compensation. So those two pillars are not met, are not uh, cannot justify this transfer system. The other problem of, of this continuous growth is that it only benefits some, and I will focus on this uh, explanation uh, in the in the following slides. Another feature is the segmentation of the supply side of the market. The deregulation gave power to some players. Uh, the, 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 player seg the, player, the market of players is segmented. We can use two different literature to, to um, fern garnish this, this idea. Uh, the dualization, of course, of the market with superstars and others, uh, and the superstars effect. How can you explain them? How can you, how can you describe them uh, with Rosen? To illustrate this segmentation, uh, I did not take the, the salaries of the stars, but I, I compared the average and the medium salaries in the main European leagues. And we can see that the average is always higher than the median, which uh, illustrates that they are like the top players, the, the players that are earn the more money, make a lot of money, a lot more money than the others. So that's, um, that, that's, that's an interesting result. And it's consistent with a, with a study made by Carrieri, he worked on the Italian uh, Serie A, and he showed that the, that the five percent players that make the more money make, uh, in, on average, five times more than the median uh, player, the player that gets the median salary. So uh, the, the the Gini coefficient is really high in the, all those leagues. So the segmentation is pretty well documented. On the demand side, there's a talent concentration because of the segmentation, again, of this demand side. Several factors explain these segmentations. Out of them, uh, some of them are the liberalization of um, audiovisual markets and the fact that those markets have different sizes and the opening of clubs to international investors. And that leads to, um, to a very diverse um, revenue generation, generated uh, flows in different leagues and clubs. And those, those different revenues lead to different uh, ability to attract talent. And that leads to a concentration of talent in several leagues and several clubs. A handful of leagues, maybe, and a handful of clubs, maybe, if I want to be more subjective. To illustrate this on leagues, I just focus on the revenues from broadcasting rights. I could have taken other illustrations. So you can see the big five. Uh, as, it, as it is called, uh, England, Spain, Germany, Italy, France, and the others are really well be below. And on the club side, um, the, the, the segmentation of the talent concentration in clubs, I looked at the at, the, at, a, at a graph that was uh, communicated a, a week ago. Um, the gap between the largest and the smallest uh, wage bill inside the league. And you can see that, for example, in France in 2018-19, Paris Saint-Germain had a wage bill which was 21 times higher than Amiens. And they play in the same division. So of course they have they can attract more talents inside um, inside uh, the same league. And if you compare, of course, European football leagues and the North American leagues, the difference is really really amazing. Another figure is that four clubs in France spend more than 50% of the whole wages expenditures in in 1819. So of course, yeah, the, the concentration is really high. The concentration of talent is really high. Another feature is the generalized intermediation, which leads to conflicts of interest and opacity. The role of agents is pretty well documented, um, economically justified by the fact that they have to solve the information issues by revealing private information, which help um, conclude deals. 
In, in football, what is really uncommon is that they have to, uh, they have a role in the context of the negotiation of employment contracts, but as well in the framework of the, the negotiation of player transfer contracts. Out of those missions, uh, agents get a, a commission, um, a lot of money actually. Uh, if you just look at what they get from the, from the Premier League clubs, in 1819, more than 300 million euros, uh, which is an increase of 75% compared to five years before. So the, the amount of money they do, they make is good, is really high. And if, if to, to make another focus, not only on, on football, but on rugby, on rugby, they then, so on rugby, where there's no um, transfers, they make, they make almost six, uh, 600,000 euros last year. So yeah, agents may make money out of those missions. This activity is, is really highly regulated, uh, regulated uh, at the international level, sometimes at the national level. This framework is changing a lot. It's, uh, there's a, a legal insecurity for agents and for all the stakeholders. But what, what, out of this regulation, the, the market is, can be characterized by several features. It, there's an unclear scope of the supply side, agents, that the debates are between agents, intermediaries, acquaintances, solicitors, lawyers, it's really blurred. There's a strong, strong segmentation of the supply side. Um, Mendes, Rayola, I'm not going to have time to talk about this, but it's, it's pretty uh, undeniable. Uh, and those guys may have market power, which is, in my opinion, a big problem. It means that they can uh, influence the allocation of players in clubs, and that's a big problem, in my opinion. Um, the situation, uh, the, the fact that only clubs pay agents in football is a source of conflicts of interest. Uh, again, that's well documented and it, it's pretty clear. When I'm talking about opacity, I, I just give one, one illustration. If you look at the FIFA TMS interme intermediary fees report in 2020, they say that 20% of international transfers involve an intermediary which is just a joke because everybody knows that almost 100% <laughs> involve an intermediary, especially the ones which are with fee, but even the other ones. So that's pretty much, that shows that the opacity is really high in this market. And then the last feature is the finalization of the market and uh, which I can just summarize by the fact that players are now seen as financial sets. This comes from the, the theory of the, the of, resource-based view, which proves that the companies um, are, are performant when they manage to own and control their resources. So clubs realize that their main resources are, are players. So now they want to own them and they want to uh, control them. <laughs> UFI showed that one third of the assets of first division clubs in Europe in 2019 were players. Um, and, and now we see that um, uh, clubs are club strategies are just based solely based on capital gains generated on the transfer market. You see Lille, you see Toulouse, you see Nice, you see others. So um, financial funds uh, come and buy clubs, and they, their only objective is to make money in the transfer market. So the, the players are seen as assets. I'm not going to have time to describe the TPO. Um, if you're interested, you can read a lot of literature on this. Uh, it was a pathological development of the labor market and in which players were really seen as financial assets. Just one illustration. This was uh, taken during my PhD, in my postdoctorate in a, in a flyer that was, that was given, in a promotion flyer that was given by one of the, the company involved in TPO. And you see that Alexander Pato was um, the, the fact that you can invest in, in Alexander Pato was uh, tr translated into time of investment, net return in euro, percentage of performance, average yearly performance. So this player is a financial asset that can be compared to any other assets. Okay, so this was this was pretty much obvious that it, that players were financial assets when TPO was still uh, was not abolished. But still, so far yet afterwards, uh, players are still. Too much, too much compared as a, a compared to financial assets. So you understood that my, my the picture is not so 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 blue. <laughs> so um, uh, I think that there's an alternative regulation that is, that is necessary. I'm gonna have to be to to be subjective and to be not exhaustive because it would be too long. So I decided to focus on just three ideas. First, to improve the overall transparency. Uh, it's not very uh, specific, but it's really important. And I will uh, answer why. And then try to negotiate a new transfer system that would eradicate speculation. 
and I think it was a focus on, on agents because I, I like this, uh, this topic. But there, there could be other regulations that I'm not going to talk about, such as the salary cap, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't have enough time. So how can we improve the overall transparency? Um, in a nutshell, the creation of the clearinghouse is, of course, a really nice idea. I'm not going to uh, give more details about this. Uh, this. To spread the scope of the TMS to domestic transfers would be really nice as well, because uh, we see as researchers that the, the reports are really, really important materials for us. So if we could work on having those kind of reports at the domestic le level, that would be awesome. And that would really improve the overall transparency. How can we create a new system that would eradicate speculation? I think it would have to, to be based on two pillars. First, we will have to create those buyout clauses that are mainly that should be mainly based on the committed, sal committed salaries due to the players. That's not an easy task. These buyout clauses uh, should be uh, calculated with uh, in a in a relevant way. But the fact that players should be considered as normal workers and that the clubs should be compensated for exactly the productivity of the of the, the, the remaining productivity of the player makes sense and it would eradicate, eradicate the, the speculation but the, the the wrong side of this idea is that the training compensation will be really low and that's really bad because that's one of the only pillar of the the current um, uh, regulation, which is really good. So in parallel of this buyout clause new system, there should be another way to, um, to compensate the training clubs. So for example, uh, creating a pool of money, uh, maybe based on the TV rights uh, or whatever, like yeah, um, FIFA, UFA club, big clubs, I don't know, that they, they, sh they should gather money in, into a pool that would be distributed to, um, to, the, to the training clubs. About the new regulation of agents, um, th the objective of this new regulation would be to better correlate the amount of money the agents make to what they are actually doing, to the missions they render to the, to, to the, um, to the market. So, so first, what is totally obvious to me is that we should ask the players to pay their agents. Players should face their own responsibilities, they should, they should be assisted by the unions, and that and clubs should be encouraged to hire sc scouts. So people are going to say it's impossible. That's never going to happen. Look, it, it, it happens in the North American leagues. It happens in cycling. It happens in other sports. I mean, it can happen and it should happen. Everybody should understand that it would be better for everyone. But at the same time, players should pay for what they need. And so I, I think that the, the current regulations are not specific enough on the, the missions that are expected from the um, the FIFA say represent, okay, you get 10% because you represent a player, oh, I think it's too much. In France, it's uh, uh, you match players and, uh, players and clubs, okay, but do you really know, do they really need you to match? Sometimes the agents don't match. I mean, the, 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 the new regulation should better describe contractually and in the regulations, of course, the missions rendered by the agents. And then if you want to, if the player wants to be represented, wants to get a match, wants to get contractual help, Etc. Etc. There should be separate pricing. If you want to use a lawyer, use a lawyer, but pay in fees. Don't give him 10% of your contract if he doesn't help you for all the missions that you want. So, and also this pricing should be discussed and negotiated with all the stakeholders. But it's, I think, it's a really nice way of making uh, a better real correlation between the, the missions and the the remunerations, the commissions. So the customization of the relationship would be something that I, that I would uh, recommend. Uh, there, should, there, there would be more like specific uh, ideas that I have. Um, I, re I wrote an article that is, is going to be published in French uh, at the beginning of 2021, and I will be able to, to circulate to you if you are interested. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Francois, for this presentation and for, to, for respecting the time perfectly. Uh, uh, we were supposed to have uh, uh, Ario uh, Klammer, but it seems that uh, he's uh, not there. Is it right? Uh, no, no, yeah. he, he's, he's here, Didier. He's here. Okay, so, uh, so now the, the next presentation is uh, what, what was planned with uh, Ario Klammer uh, from the University of uh, Erasmus in, 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 in Netherlands. So, uh, Ario, you have the floor. Yeah, I will present together with uh, Dolf Segar. Um, Dolf, you have the presentation on um, to share the screen. 
Yeah, I saw that it would be set up by uh, the organization, but uh, apparently not. So I have to. Yeah, um, maybe. I mean, yeah, that that was um, expect. That was written in the emails and expect and written in um, yeah. But anyway, um, so I, I will try and do it. But uh, yeah. I would do it. Yeah, okay. Now, while we uh, trying to share the screen, I can uh, start off um, our presentation. Um, uh, in a way, the, our presentation follows uh, the previous two presentations, and we are mainly interested in, um, uh, in the compliance and regulation of, uh, the, of the sports. Um, uh, Dolph Segar is an, uh, a lawyer. I am a cultural economist. Um, and we have joined forces uh, because we share an interest in the sports. And, um, and what we um, want to uh, address are actually issues that also came up in the previous presentations, uh, the issue of sponsoring and that that can have bad impact on the club and will uh, create animosity among the fans. Uh, we saw just a presentation of the labor market with the excesses that uh, are clearly illustrated. And when you see how uh, salaries that certain clubs pay compared to salaries that other clubs pay, and then you really wonder what is the fairness in the competition. Um, and both previous presentations uh, uh, give some suggestions. What concerns us mainly is indeed um, the way the sports world work and the way they can discipline and uh, enforce compliance. And we have a five sphere model, which I will illustrate and then Dolph will take over and, and give, uh, bring up some, uh, put it especially in the European context and then draws conclusion. <clears throat> My mind put is, is uh, mainly uh, what I call the five sphere model. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that consists out of five spheres, each with its own logic, its own practices, um, that in, but uh, with the recognition that uh, clubs, players, fans operate in all five in some way or another. <clears throat> it implies that, that, um, that, that most often, and that you also saw in the presentation of Jean-Francois, is that we focus on the spheres of the M and the G. M stands for market, G stands for governance. So often the analysis focus on, on and that's what economists are inclined to do, on the logic of the market, demand, supply, and we just heard it, labor markets, uh, salaries, prices, and that's all part of the M logic. Um, the G logic, which also uh, features prominently, in both previous presentations is the logic of governance, uh, rules, regulations, uh, bodies, um, organizations, uh, that is what the G logic is about. But what as we want to point out that originally and still to a great extent, uh, sports is a social affair taking place in the social sphere, the S, where people uh, have informal interactions, share interest, play together, uh, cheer together, uh, join uh, the crowd, so to say, in the stadiums, and it all takes place in the social sphere. Uh, the O stands for the oikos, the home, that is to a certain extent relevant, but I bypass it for the time being, and then uh, finally want to pay attention to the C, that is the cultural sphere, and that too seems to function, uh, have an important function. Cultural sphere is basically making sense of yourself as uh, Dutch, as Spanish, French, uh, but also it is the culture of sports versus the culture of art. Um, it's the way people understand uh, and make sense of their, their life or their activities. Now, <clears throat> our argument is that, um, that and that's the issue that we are addressing, is that sports are very attached to being a an, an part of the, of the S. And that um, all the sports societies, they are organized societies, 
want to maintain the social character of the sports, want to also regulate and uh, enforce compliance within, among each other, among the clubs, among um, the, the, the organizations that the clubs have formed, and that they are in that sense, a sort of an autonomous body. The problem, however, is, and that's what we saw in the previous conversation, uh, discussions, that the logic of the M uh, increasingly starts dominating and crowding out, as we economists like to say, the S. So uh, the, the financial interest take over and um, it is, um, and that causes all kinds of difficult uh, issues with the sports world. And that implies also, and that we saw in the previous uh, presentation, that governments uh, are getting increasingly involved uh, by, by having all kinds of regulations imposed on the sports world. And that causes friction because the sports world would like to regulate itself. And the question is if that is still possible, uh, that they are be able to withstanding this huge financial interest for all, from all kinds of parties that see sports more as a uh, source of revenue, as a source of profit, uh, than that they are interested in, um, in sports as such. And that seems to also undermine uh, the cultural uh, logic uh, that uh, <coughs> we wonder what, uh, what, are the, what is the meaning, what is sports is all about, if the competition uh, becomes so unfair, uh, are we, can we really talk about uh, fairness in sports? And we see that in the United States, people take uh, have measures like drafts. It's interesting that Jean Paul is not proposing that, but that's as a way uh, to equalize uh, the competition. But anyway, uh, this is the model that we operate. And Dolph, you can take over and then show how we apply that in various contexts. Yeah, maybe for the next slide. And yeah, what what we have seen in. Um... What we have tried to do is to, to uh, connect the five years model on the, to the uh, European sports pyramid. As we all know that we have the grassroots clubs and then we have the, the clubs, federations, and then it becomes more and more professional, the European federation in charge of the European sport. But not only in football, but all sports are organized in more or less the same way with regard to the, um, the European sport pyramid. And um, as we have seen uh, by the Treaty for the Function of the European Union, the TFEU, that they have more or less given sports a specific position within the economy, within other, as you compare it to other industry sectors, now, where in a number of industry sectors, the anti-competition rules and the uh, free movement rules are taken very strict you see uh, with regard to transfer rules in, in football for instance but as well in other sports like with doping issues etc that um, and, and and distribution of monies between first leagues and second leagues and into grassroots teams you can see that the european union allows uh, the sport because of their specific characteristics another position than uh, other industries would um, would have been given by the uh, by the by the european union so what we said that already in the white paper on sport in 2007, you have seen that there was an economic dimension and fall, uh, sports fall within the scope. But in, mean, in the meantime, there's an article on the uh, 165, which gives some more reliance to, uh, to the specific characteristics of sports. They, uh, they say that sports shall contribute to the promotion of European sporting issues while taking account of the specific nature. And the specific nature we're talking about the integration, inclusion of people, the social concept, etc. So you see very much from the Article 165 that the European Union um, uh, focuses on the social logic, as Ario just explained. As sports is the social logic is important for the European Union, um, and um, they say further that. Um, uh, by promoting fairness and openness in sporting competition and cooperation between bodies responsible for sports and by protecting the physical and moral integrity of sportsmen and sportswomen, especially the youngest sportsmen and sportswomen, that the, uh, that the European focused very much on the social logic, on the regulation side, that, that the protection side, so the malpractices they want to avoid. And um, 
what we have mentioned that when the market sphere comes in more and more and becomes more important into sports and the social function or the, 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 the cultural function uh, will be diminished because of the market function, there might become a moment in which the autonomy, which is now granted to sports compared to other industries, might be taken away from, um, from sports and governments will, well, comparable to other, uh, uh, like, like doping issues, etc. Uh, if the malpractices and the, the market issue uh, becomes too large um, and cannot be controlled anymore by the federations themselves, there might be come a moment in time that the uh, governments will um, will, will in enter this, the sports market is in the same way as they do in other uh, industries and therefore taking away the autonomy, which we believe is not the best um, way for sports, uh, for the development of sports and for, for the, the development of grassroots sports. So we, we suggest in our uh, model to have a... Um, well, to maybe at the moment of in time, it is it could be uh, become important that governments and and sports work more closely together, in order to regulate uh, certain aspects of sports, in order to avoid the malpractice as uh, compared to WADA, which was established by governments and sport together, in order to uh, combat the um, uh, to combat the, um, the, the 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 doping uh, malpractices. Um, I believe that is uh, um, uh, so. But what we said, we, we advocate forms of partnership between international governmental authorities and sports organization, organizations like WADA. Um, so so far, I think within time, um, we um, this is what we uh, would like to present to you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dolph and uh, and Alio, and sorry for the presentation uh, incomplete. Uh, so uh, we we can open now uh, a moment for for a discussion. And as Jean-François explained before, uh, we have three uh, participants that uh, will make some remarks or, or questions to to launch the, the discussion. And I propose to uh, Mr. Uh, Pipo Russo to start. Uh, uh, Pippo is a, a sociologist of the University of Florence and also a journalist. And uh, you, you are the first one for, to, to, to launch this, this debate. You have the floor. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, good morning to all. And uh, first of all, I am really proud to be uh, in this discussion, a very, very exciting discussion and three, uh, three relations really uh, stimulative. And uh, in, uh, in my opinion, uh, all three relations are on the responsibility in football, uh, a responsibility that needs to involve all actors of football uh, concerning uh, football fans, uh, football players, football officials, uh, and football institutions. But as you know, I am uh, uh, mainly focused on uh, football transfer market of players. And so if I have in my small and quick time to speak, uh, if I have to propose some remarks, uh, I focus on the second uh, relation, uh, that uh, of Jean-Francois. Uh, I was very interested uh, concerning the discourse of Jean-Francois. I I share his opinions and uh, I think that we can do a step ahead because uh, we need to uh, take in account, we need to, uh, to be aware that we are now in the uh, economy of pandemia, in the COVID economy. And so we need also to change uh, some focus uh, concerning this uh, changing in the in the general economy and in the football market economy 
Uh, as you know, as Jean-Francois know, I am uh, from long time focused on third party ownership, on the power of super agents. We need to focus on super agents, not on uh, specifically agents, because in my opinion, agents without super are normal people that are professional and uh, football players need to be uh, assisted by agent. We need to focus on super agents. That is to say, uh, they are not intermediaries. They are people that create the market, not people that intermediate the market. And in the relation, Jean-Francois, uh, underlined so well this uh, specific point. But uh, if I can add some remarks, uh, I need to underline that uh, just because we are in the economy of pandemics, uh, we are at risk in European football to uh, import by Italy, a case study that I know well, some vices, some economic vices of Italian football. And uh, I explain what are the risks. Um, Jean-Francois underlined the, the question, the, the matter of capital gains in the transfer market. As you know, capital gains uh, are vital for the uh, financial health of football clubs. But uh, we in Italy um, set up a system to uh, guarantee uh, financial health uh, to annual accounts. That is uh, the mechanism that I name uh, cross capital gains. That is to say, uh, two clubs exchanges uh, two football players for the same value, the same uh, overvalued value, and these benefits, the uh, annual accounts, these, uh, do, uh, uh, these create a situation in which uh, the, the annual accounts are sound, and these are uh, as we say in Italian, a financial doping, because this distort competition, uh, this give uh, some clubs the chance to compete without having a sound situation. And uh, uh, so this is the, the matter, this is the point that I had to the discussion. Um, me as, a, as an investigator, as an investigative journalist and not only as a sociologist investigated those specific uh, matter in the economy of football in Italy. Maybe someone of you know that uh, some uh, two uh, football seasons ago, uh, the football clubs of Chievo was deducted point for financial tricks. And this started for, my, for one of my uh, investigation because I demonstrate that uh, the football club of Chievo and football club of Cesena that then won, went in finance exchanged young football player for exaggerated amount of money. And those generated capital gains that uh, adjusted the annual accounts of both clubs, and that was a trick. And in the economy of pandemics, this method is at risk to be uh, adopted by a lot of football clubs in Europe. And I have also some uh, demonstration of it. If you uh, see at the curious exchange in January 2020 between Barcelona and Valencia, two goalkeepers, Neto and Silesen, for 30 million euro, an exaggerated amount of money, and this adjusted the annual accounts. But the same uh, happened recently in the, in the football transfer by Osimen from Lille to Naples. Lille needed to have an exaggerated 
capital gain and uh, overvalued uh, Aussie men 70 million euros. But in exchange, Naples sold four players uh, for a total amount of 20 million euros. Three out of this of those players are young players that was loaned by Lille to a third division football club in Italy. And those football players are regularly on the bench. And so this is the, uh, the matter. We need to now for evitate that this dark economy, this falsification economy uh, could affect the entire uh, structure of economy of football in Europe, we need now to uh, have an in-deep analysis on the concept of fair value. We need to fix an objective con uh, concept of fair values because as you know, uh, when uh, uh, there is an exchange of football players, there is the uh, capital gain on the side of selling, but there is also the asset on the buying selling, on the buying uh, uh, side. The three football players that Lille loaned to Fermana, a third division football club in Italy, are 15 million euro of asset in the annual accounts of Lille. This is a fair value. We need to uh, in deep analyze this concept because this will be in the next time uh, the real problem in the economy of European football. And that's thank all you. by me. Thanks okay. for all. Th th thank, thank you very you people. much, uh, people. It's a very interesting uh, development. Uh, Jean-Francois, you want to react or add something? No, 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 no. Let's, let's have okay. the others uh, speak. So uh, we are lucky also uh, enough to have uh, Alex Philippe, uh, until recently, head of uh, compliance uh, and, uh, and um, governance <laughs> at, at UEFA. He's now independent advisor and he has a great, great knowledge about football in Europe and in the world. Alex, uh, some reaction or some question? Thank you. Merci. Can you hear me? Yes. So I'm speaking as a practitioner, not as an academic. But thanks very much for the uh, interesting presentations. First, a quick comment uh, on yeah, my personal background was, uh, working in financial analysis of football with Deloitte. I worked on the, the creation of this new transfer system uh, and uh, the central marketing of rights, the creation of supporters direct Europe, financial fair play, uh, the, the conception of these different uh, initiatives to regulate uh, professional football in Europe. Apologies if some of them haven't worked out so well. Uh, but that, that's my background. On the four trends that were raised at the beginning, I just wanted to make a brief comment. Firstly, completely agree that the sporting uh, power is becoming dominated by the financial power. Secondly, on sporting inequalities, yes, this again is a trend I would agree with. However, in European sport, we have two levels, the national level and the European or international level. And if you create more balance on one level, you're likely to create an imbalance on the other level and vice versa. So therefore the question is, these inequalities will never go away. And they, by definition, they can't go away in a pyramid system. Uh, but where would uh, the actors, the decision makers, like the inequalities to be better balanced? That's the question. In terms of abuses, completely agree. This is, this is going up hugely. For example, a report to the European Commission the year before last said that 80 billion euros is uh, laundered, illegal money is laundered through football in the EU every year. That's just one example. But the final point I wouldn't agree with entirely in the sense that wages and transfer spending is going up in an unsustainable way because 
if you go back to L'Equipe, any edition from the 1950s, you'll see exactly the same discussion and the same in the Times uh, in, in London, in the England. Years ago, exactly the same things were being said. Wages are unsustainable, they're too high. How can it be that somebody earns so much money, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the comments I'll make on the trends. And then I think <clears throat> in the chat, you've asked to come up with a couple of ideas to focus our contribution. I'm just reading. Yeah, so if I could introduce two specific measures this is personally, of course, everything I'm saying is my personal opinion. It's not UEFA's view. Uh, I would introduce on the balance side a cap on the number of professional contracts that the biggest clubs are allowed to have, because this is a measure that increases sporting balance both within and across leagues. Uh, and part of the problem that we have at the moment in European football is that the biggest clubs have too much money. So what do they do with that money to exercise, uh, to try and further their objectives? Well, they sign up the best young players from across the rest of Europe and across the rest of the world. And this doesn't help anybody because most of those young players don't play. They're in a country far away from home. They often go back as worse players than than when they, they began. This is a regulation that has worked in some countries in the past, Spain, Portugal, for example. Uh, it's easy to police and easy to understand. Everyone can relate to that. It's not like financial fair play, which is very, very difficult to understand. Uh, so this is something that I think would enable uh, more balance uh, across and within competitions and it also doesn't touch the financial distribution, which is, again, something that's very hard to change. So that would be one measure. The second measure is probably harder to implement, but I think is the solution to the financial instability in football, which is to connect the revenues to the costs. Because if, for example, there were a standard player contract that could be how that would be established is a separate question, could be negotiated through a collective bargaining agreement. That's what happens on national level. But even looking at it nationally, if there were standard player contracts where the salaries of the players would go up proportionately if the club was promoted or if it were qualifying for the Champions League, say by 30%, or if they were relegated, Conversely, their salary would decline in proportion. Then this would connect the revenues with the costs, and we wouldn't be left with the situation that we have now, where basically most player wages are fixed, whereas revenues are very variable. And this creates a huge in instability in the, the financial system. And this would help to solve this problem. In the US, they do this on a global level, so what 54, 60% of total revenues to be spent on wages or player wages, whatever the figure is, but it can be done on, a, on an individual level with individual player contracts, as well as on a global level. So those are the two measures uh, I, would I would propose off the top of my head, I haven't prepared, uh, for, prepared for this. And I think I will just, uh, yeah, I wouldn't, Add anything to that? Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Alex, for this uh, very interesting remarks. Uh, we we can uh, take the, the third uh, speakers uh, to to uh, launch the debate, but we, we can keep in mind that uh, Alex proposed two uh, main uh, uh, ideas to to regulate, and maybe the the speakers will at the end of this uh, last uh, uh, intervention will uh, propose themselves their own uh, uh, main ideas. So Marcus uh, Kurscheid, uh, professor um, at the Beirut University and vice president of International Association of Sports Economists uh, will uh, also give us uh, some remarks or questions. Marcus, you have the floor. Yeah, uh, thank you, Didier. Um, 
First of all, I invite you to join our huge network of the International Association of Sports Economists. It's the best association of the world because we don't <laughs> charge a membership fee. <laughs> so you can be part of us uh, simply by registration. Um, so I, I, in a, at the University of Bayreuth, I chair the Department of Sport Governance and Event Management. So uh, the governance perspective is our key issue. And um, Alex and Pippo nicely commented on, on the financial side and on, uh, on the transfer market. So um, I will come back a little bit to our, uh, to our key topic of regulation. If we want to re-regulate or change the regulation, find a new model of regulation, then we need to have the right principles uh, that that we, um, that we want to follow. It's one thing what uh, Alex just mentioned, um, uh, having ideas on how can we uh, tackle the uh, key problems, the key issues uh, um, in financial regulation, for instance, and also transfer market uh, reforms and so on. This is one side and this is needed. However, to be convincing, to be sustainable in the medium and long term with the, um, uh, with the new model of regulation, then we talk about, uh, about um, you know, uh, organizational change and what we have seen and, uh, and we are not satisfied with the, with the uh, outcome. What we have seen is a really long-term uh, long uh, um, development organizational change uh, over decades. And now we are debating um, uh, what can we do about this? So uh, what we want to change is something that happened over 20, 30 years. Uh, so we really need a new orientation and this is kind of lacking. And then I, I, come, um, I come back to the, uh, and therefore I like very much uh, what, um, uh, what uh, Ario and Dolph were raising to say, hey, um, please remember I'm citing you, sport is a social affair. So the finances in, in uh, European football, although we are talking about professional football and uh, a business and so on, but the function is for society. The function is for sports, for the values of sports. I may remind you all, and I am an economist, you know, I remind you all of the Olympic spirit and things like that. So this is really what we, if it's just about business, then forget about all this. Please abolish UEFA and then we create a European Super League and then the game is over, then it's business. Uh, but that's, that's not what we are after. So the economy should serve society, not the other way around. And this, and so I'm raising this. This is, it sounds quite moralistic and so on, but uh, I'm raising this because we need new orientation for this, uh, for this huge challenge of creating new uh, regulation. Um, finally, uh, since um, uh, Christian Brandt is, is my PhD student and from my uh, department, so his uh, studies um, uh, touch upon our focus on fan governance. So uh, beyond the players, the other key um, stakeholder group are the fans. But the, this is a very, very, also a very, very segment, uh, segmented um, uh, market with a, a strong segmentation. We are always talking about the fans. They are not the fans. There is a huge diversity. And we are going into that with, uh, um, uh, with field work, uh, um, but, uh, 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 participating observation and so on, but also with a larger service. And therefore, for instance, we continuously find among so-called active football fans, so the frequent stadium goers, those, according to Hirschman's exit and voice, 
those who raise the voice and those who uh, are threatening with uh, exit, so drop out, so leaving the stadia. So uh, we, we are surveying them and two thirds of them are, are uh, saying uh, commercialization harms the fans. And this is continuous. So as experts in economics of sports and, and politics, regulation of sports, uh, it's a challenge for us. We cannot be satisfied with the situation that two thirds of active football fans are really pissed off. I cannot, sorry for the wording, but they are pissed off. And they are saying this, they are raising the voice and uh, so, uh, and what, what uh, Christian Brandt is studying with the breakaway clubs are showing, okay, they are trying already on the very, very low level, they are trying to develop a new idea of football governance. Uh, and as we see, of course, um, they, they are uh, faced with a lot of problems because then they have also to deal with the finances, with uh, sponsors and so on. However, this is an interesting experiment and we should have a look at this. Every activity in designing something new in regulation on the lowest level, on the highest level, are welcome for the time being. To, de, uh, to create new ideas. In Germany, the German Bundesliga, the DFL has uh, formed a so-called task force future of football, of professional football, and um, diverse uh, uh, stakeholder representatives from society are involved there. And um, this is now, uh, with the crisis of the pandemic, it's, um, it's, the first and maybe the last big chance of creating something new for the regulation in national football. So in Germany, in France and so on, and on the uh, European level. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Marcus. Maybe we can come back to the three uh, speakers. Uh, I think we have different, we have a lot of questions uh, on the discussion uh, in, in the site, in the website. Um, but we can maybe start uh, with uh, your uh, ideas and your remark uh, regarding the, the proposals uh, made by, by, um, by Alex, uh, but also your own uh, main uh, ideas to, to, uh, uh, to, to re-equilibrate uh, this uh, power, uh, probably uh, uh, unbalanced for the moment between financial and sporting uh, power. Um, and uh, this is the, 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 first, uh, the first point. Uh, maybe uh, another question in, in, the, in the discussion part, uh, another uh, uh, proposal is uh, to, to uh, dedicate uh, a minimum uh, amount of money or percentage of revenue from, uh, from, the, um, from the, the, the club to uh, social activities and uh, uh, corporate uh, responsibility, we can say uh, largely, that it seemed to be another way to uh, limit the, the, the power of, uh, of financing in football. So uh, Jeff, uh, Ario, uh, Dolph and, uh, and Christian, who wants to, to take the lead on that question? Yeah, well, I, I, I can start to say to give some uh, some ideas I have, and I was listening to um, to the uh, the speakers after us. Um, well, I, I was triggered by Marcus, who indeed um, set aside the uh, set between um, yeah, he had a view on the governmental um, uh, interference and the sporting uh, matters, and if you indeed would start a super league or whatever. Uh, in football, then um, yeah, you are a real business, and then the the social part of the um, of of the sport will uh, will um, will leave, and that's exactly the discussion what's going on now. The richest club, which which was mentioned as well, that the richer clubs are getting richer, um, 
and therefore you need to have some financial um, regulation which which will, will diminish the enormous amounts but but the contrary effect is going on at the moment because if you see that the super league is discussed between the five uh, big nations with the, the larger club of those five big nations um, there was an article in the financial times recently which 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 had its most dangerous game uh, re referring to this uh, super league as a, as a dangerous game and the idea behind the super league is that the richer club will remain to participate in their own comp home competition and on Wednesday play the Super League where they earn a lot of money. Um, and it is our fear from the presentation we gave is the five sphere model. As soon as such uh, that it is getting mingled, so the richer club playing a Super League, playing a Super League and participating in their home countries, that governments will at a certain moment of time say, now, well, Football has become a business and the social part of football will be left out. So what I believe with regard to the finance first in the sporting power that we should find a way in which the sporting power will, will get the overhand and become more important. And perhaps, as we said, it should be an idea with regard to financials of football that government and, and the sport work together in a system in which... Um, yeah, well, in which the, the malpractice caused by the by the financials will be uh, diminished. So I, I what well, yeah, the idea is to have government and, and sport work more closely together with regard to the financials. Okay, thank you, uh, Christian or Jean Francois. Do you have uh, some additional comment or reaction? Well, I would uh, not su suggest really measures like like Alex uh, did um, but I, I think it's it's uh, or as I hope I uh, my presentation also shows it's that these fans which in a way sometimes seem to be quite radical or, or whatever or far beyond every financial issues which are currently going on in football I think this is not the picture we should draw I think they could be also integrated in some um, discussions negotiations how football should be and how it should be regulated and of course, if I just have a look at the, the players, of course, we always, in a lot of cases, we think about these superstars, whatever. But on the other hand, uh, there are quite a lot of players. And I think not all, especially if we look at the lower European leagues, are not all are satisfied. So I, I just remind uh, and it would suggest to um, offer participation in further regulation processes for further stakeholders and not just looking on the big financial issues. That's, that's all. Okay, uh, Jean-Francois, uh, do you have some reaction? And I can add another question we have in the, in the discussion part. Uh, so someone uh, proposed uh, to, to ban or to limit uh, for cash uh, player trades like uh, it exists in uh, American leagues. Uh, what do you think of the different remarks, but also uh, about this this uh, proposal? Proposal. Yeah, th thank you, uh, people. Thank you, thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Alex. Um, I, I really liked your comments. Of course, um, uh, back to what people said. Um, the financial doping is uh, is clear. Um, we you gave examples. We could have given more. Um, the question is: uh, Are clubs normal companies? Uh, if they are. Uh, it's no problem that they are they have debts. It's no problem they are in deficits. It's no problem they doped financially. They get doped financially. Uh, but I, I think it is because I think clubs are not normal companies because they belong to a sector that is very specific because of the peculiarities that I explained earlier. Uh, clubs co-produce a product um, and this product is sold. And um, if some clubs are are cheating financially uh, that gives a bad image to the product and eventually that's gonna hopefully <laughs> the product is gonna lose its its, its value but uh, yeah there's a lot of examples about what, what Alex uh, mentioned the cap of number of the, the cap in number of contracts is a very good idea I think we'll I think that's we are as close as it goes uh, when it comes to this regulation because uh, Chelsea Monaco uh, there's a lot of examples and it's undeniable that it's it's not normal and that you cannot play with uh with the quantity of players um and just expect that one of them is going to make you gain money uh yeah I'm, I'm more 
I'm less convinced in the short term about your idea of uh, of capping of really like correlating the value of the player to the to the revenues of the club. It's a very good idea, of course. I don't really see how we could implement it in the short term, but a very good idea as well. And yeah, of course, there's a lot, many other things I would like to say, but I, I don't want to keep the floor too long. Uh, we we have time for uh, still uh, three uh, three minutes uh, for additional. There are some com commentary, uh, but uh, not really other questions except regarding uh, the limitation of the number of teams in a sh in a in a championship. Do you think uh, all of you that it can be also a solution to uh, to to recalibrate uh, sporting uh, power? Uh, compared to financial power in limitation uh, the, the number of team uh, maybe 18 instead that uh, 20 uh, uh, team in uh, in general in the first leagues what do you think about that uh, other proposal can i comment uh, yeah of course try to sort of oh, yeah. see i think that the tenor of of uh, all the presentations and also the interesting additional comments that we got is um, pointing to an, the, the question whether the current system is, uh, is tenable, sustainable, and whether we can continue along the path that we are walking right now. And I, I interpret actually all the contributions uh, to suggest that some intervention is needed. And I think that it is useful for us what we do now um, as uh, economists and lawyers interested in the subject um, to see how we make sense of it. And I was pleased that, that we came to recognize that uh, sports is not a market, uh, a normal market, that sport clubs are not normal businesses. And that's more is at stake uh, as we addressed and, and Mark is also uh, uh, supports is that we have to think about the social and cultural uh, dimensions. And I myself as an cultural economist and looking for concepts that help us to make sense of this. A concept that is sort of related to the social, but it's a concept I, I also uh, uh, study the cultural sector. Uh, and there we are using the notion of a commons. Uh, something, and I think that Jean uh, Francois uh, was sort of getting there, is that that we are having. You are in the sports world. You are, you have a common interest with all these others uh, involved, with the stakeholders, with all the other clubs, with the fans, uh, the sport writers, and so on. And so, uh, it is not just your self-interest that you're promoting as a club, but you have a shared interest. And now that is socially organized. Uh, but as we are arguing, uh, Dolph and I, is the question is whether with all these financial interests and all the excesses that occur now, whether that's sustainable and that we have to make, rethink about what sports is all about. And I think that a seminar that we have now is an attempt to sort things out. And if you come to certain proposals, the question is whether that's indeed where we want to end up. Uh, I think we're still probing. Um, but I think it always starts uh, with, with how we make sense of this. And I think that we all agree that we have to look beyond markets to understand uh, the sports. And I think the battle is really, is the sports able to regulate itself as it tries to do now, or does it involve the involvement of other parties, say governments, international governments? And Dolph and I say that we have to face up to reality and better look for a collaboration, then uh, antagonism, and then at one point governments uh, going to intervene, and then you are out of control, basically. I think it's a very good conclusion for this first panel. Uh, Jeff, I give, give you back the floor. Everybody, uh, hello everybody, sorry. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today and to have the chance to moderate this panel, uh, which is going to deal with uh, one of the main and oldest topic in professional sport economics, I, I guess. Uh, it will deal with uncertainty and competitive balance uh, and more especially on the lack of equi equilibrium, uh, which is a, a real big issue to tackle for professional football. 
Um, to discuss about that, we will have the honor to welcome uh, three speakers. Uh, Sean Hamill from, the, from Burbeck, uh, University of London, and then Fabio Wagner uh, from Mainz University and Thomas Koneke from the Catholic University of Leuven. Uh, so thank you, thank you three to be here. Thank you for presenting and sharing uh, some elements with us. Uh, I can ask you to respect the timing, uh, 20 minutes per presentation, and, uh, and then we will discuss about uh, many, uh, many interesting topics. So Sean, you have the floor and uh, uh, you can go for 20 minutes. We, we can see your screen, Shen. Uh, maybe you can put in a presentation mode. I'm trying to find it actually. Oh, right on, yeah. Yeah. Can you can see that okay? Can you see can you see the slides? Yeah, we, we can see this. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Go on. Okay, guys. So um, my name is Sean Hamill from Bradbury College, University of London. Um, I'm going to talk for 20 minutes about if the global football hierarchy uh, pyramid is under threat. Um, just a few declarations, uh, just this is what I'll cover. Um, give it a bit of context to what I'm gonna talk about. Um, recap what the classical European pyramid organization of world football really is. Um, talk about why I feel the FIFA club world cup reformat proposal is a, is a, is a concerning development. Talk a little bit about the Premier League's recent project big picture proposal, which also raised some concerns and then conclude with just some thoughts on what I think might be a contribution to the, um, uh, the, the, the debate about the, um, the reorganization or the, the new format for the European club competitions, which has been debated at the moment. Uh, just a declaration of interest. Um, I've been heavily involved with the MESGO program for the last 10 years, which is supported by the European Handball Federation, FIBA for Basketball, International Ice Hockey Federation, and UEFA. I've also worked on the UEFA Masters for International Players, the UEFA Certificate for Football Management. We ran a course for FIFA at Birkbeck, and I also did some teaching in the Euro League. So today I'm speaking in a personal capacity, but I expect some might say, I've done quite a bit of work with the traditional sports federations, particularly UEFA. So you can, today I'm speaking on my own behalf. If you feel I'm influenced by that, then you, you know my background. I just put it out there. Um, some context. Um, I mean, my first degree was economics and politics. Um, I'm in a management department now. What I'm going to present today are really some initial thoughts for a paper I'm developing. I don't pretend it's, it's developed to a huge degree, but hopefully you'll find it interesting and provoke some debate. I think it's interesting, though, if you, if you look at the sort of, I mean, I just was looking for some kind of framework. And, you know, I, I I'm, I'm unashamedly believe that it's, it's, it's useful to have a framework, a governmental framework. I don't believe in anarchy and I don't really believe in unregulated free markets either. I think that, you know, even to have properly functioning markets, you need a proper legal framework to enforce contracts and protect property rights. You know, you can't have a market without that basic legal framework. And I think that if you look at what, you know, we've, you know, we've had peace in Europe since the Second World War. I mean, one of the reasons is because of, a, or well, certainly in Western Europe, uh, a network of international organizations and regulations were developed to make that happen. And in this particular discussion at Chatham House, the, the foreign policy uh, forum in, in, in London, they, they talked about one of the problems at the moment with the, with the breakdown in the, in, in the uh, influence of these, uh, these um, uh, institutions. So that there was, a, there was a problem of a loss of legitimacy. So for example, the US invasion of Iraq led to a sort of lack of legitimacy uh, in the, the international legal framework because some interpreted it as an uh, example of might is right. 
and we might say there's a there's an element of that in the sports context at the moment where the big clubs are saying, well, we are, we've got the we've got the we generate the money, we generate the audiences, therefore our views should be the most listened to. Chatham House also talked about this concept of lack of equity that um, as society has become more divided. Um, you know that if the system is, is, is not perceived to be working for the majority but for the minority that this becomes a problem particularly after the 2008 economic crisis and I think we can see the same thing in football that there's there's a view developing now that actually increasingly the system is working for the big clubs but the question is is it working for everybody else uh, the final point is that you know there, there needs to be reflection on how the system is working because the danger is that with any regulatory system that you know self-confidence becomes complacency and there's a need for a sensitivity about new actors for example so you know i mean is every single key stakeholder really represented within the international football uh, regulatory framework at the moment I, I just put that question out there i think it's an interesting question um now if we go on i think we're at a very difficult moment at the moment in in, in the sports world because what the COVID crisis has done is it's, it's accentuated financial vulnerability that was already there and it's created a crisis basically a large significant elements within the football world have got cash flow problems now the difficulty with that is that people become desperate and they they they, they look for radical solutions and the problem with radical solutions in in a in a, in a sort of period of of um, crisis is that it can lead to the law of unintended consequences and you end up in a situation which you didn't anticipate and which you're actually worse off than you were before. Now there's been a lot of discussion today about this closed league and I mean I quite like quotations I think that they can really put things into um, focus and this is Charles, Charles Stellatano the organization the organizer of the International Champions Cup Football Club Friendly Tournament he, he, is a, he is an American entertainment business entrepreneur that, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a, it's a legitimate vision. It just doesn't have to be a vision that I particularly share. But this is, he actually, I think in this quotation, he, he really spells it out where a lot of people who have got involved in football from an entertainment business point of view, where they want to go. So let me read the quote out to you. He, he, he basically, the competition he runs is a friendly tournament over the summer. He says, still a time to explain uh, he's making the case for a closed European Football League. The competition would serve only the sides who generated the most money for the game and had the biggest fan bases, while smaller clubs, such as Premier League leader Leicester and, well, obviously, and, and Eric the VC Giant faced the AP Eindhoven would not be invited. And then he says, quote unquote, what would Manchester United argue? Did we create soccer or did Leicester create it? And then he goes on, he says, let's call it the money pot created by soccer and the fandom around the world. Who has had a more integral role, Manchester United or Leicester? And then he says, I guess they don't have the birthright to be in it every year, but it's an age-old argument. New sports franchises versus what we have in Europe. There's wonderful, wonderful elements to, rele to re relegation and promotion, and there are good arguments for a closed system. But then he concludes, but suddenly when you see who we have in the summer in the ICC, his, his friendly tournament, you're going to shake your head and say, isn't that the Champions League? And then he says, so the Champions League is PSV and Ghent. Now this is this is one alternative of where we could go to. Um, it, there's nothing wrong with it in, in one sense, but you know, if we don't agree with it, this this is what we have to you know we have to come up, we have to propose whatever model that we uh, that is an alternative and this has to be superior to it for all the stakeholders. And I think we, you know, we, we just we just we owe him a debt of gratitude for uh, spelling out in, in, in such detail, you know, what you know where we could be going. Now let's look at the classic model. Here it is. It's the classic European model of sport. It's a hierarchy in football. You got FIFA at the top, then you got the regional confederations, and the national associations, the national leagues, the clubs. What has happened over the last fifteen years is that. We have also seen the development of bilateral engagement. So FIFA has a FIFA stakeholders committee where it engages with European Clubs Association, or the, the World Clubs Association, I should say, European Leagues, etc. FIFA, 
UEFA has developed a whole set of bilateral um, uh, uh, institutional relationships with various key stakeholders. Now, I think this is a positive thing because what it does is it, it, it brings, um, it brings um, you know, key actors into the, uh, into, the, into the system. And, you know, we can also see here that, the, you know, the, but what will be in so is that the, the, the key sort of pyramid aspect of it remains, FIFA will only recognize one national association and one league pyramid in any member country. And um, if you look at the statutes, it says, statute 22.3 obligates each regional confederation to ensure that international leagues and any other such groups of clubs or leagues shall not be formed without its consent and approval of a FIFA. If you look at the UEFA statutes, 51 bits, it says the club's entitlement to take part in the domestic league championship shall depend principally on sporting merit. A club shall qualify for a domestic league championship by remaining in a certain division. So there's a commitment to promotion and relegation. And what I would say is in the side is that the associated problem of utility maximization where clubs prioritize sporting success in order to uh, um, over profitability leading to loss making. I mean, I would be I think that the financial fair play system actually has been broadly effective in addressing that problem and hasn't probably got the credit that it deserves. They know that the various Manchester, there's been various cases recently, like the Manchester City one, where people have raised concerns about it. But, you know, I think myself that it's done quite a good job. Now, the reason why I'm focusing on the promotion and relegation is because this is central to the European model. And I think it's one of the reasons why um, football is the global sport because it's so popular, because this model of promotion and relegation delivers the sort of Darwinian sporting intensity that drives in interest. And, you know, I was for 10 years involved in Supporters Direct, promoting supporter ownership of clubs. But the, big, the biggest single thing I learned from that was that it doesn't matter what the ownership model is if the club is not well managed. And, you know, some of you may think, well, He's, he's promoting RB Salzburg as, as a, as a, as a well-managed club. Well, I am because, you know, when I would prefer them to be, you know, a classic, you know, fan-owned club, the reality is that they're very well-managed. They have brought something to the uh, Bundesliga. Um, the people, or sorry, that should be RB Leipzig, I should say. And, you know, the people in the city follow them. So, the, the, the promotion and relegation system has allowed that club to rise up to the top of the Bundesliga in the same way as the system has allowed Leicester City to do it. And the other side I would make is that not every club that has moved up to the top level in European football has done it through having a sugar daddy owner. There are examples, again, Leicester is a good example, of clubs who have been able to achieve this through good management in, in, a, in a system where you have promotion and relegation. Um, now, I want to conclude this part of the presentation by saying that actually the European model of sport has served football very, very well. You know, it has, you know, it is the reason why it's the global sport. For example, we have very vibrant global, and uh, you know, FIFA and European UEFA national team competitions, which people love. In the North American model, we have a situation where even for prestige competitions like Olympic competitions, players are not released to play. We have very vibrant European continental professional club competitions, cross continent. By and large, in North American sports, they don't have that. Um, we have vibrant national professional club competitions. So we have a situation where the championship, the second tier in England, is the fifth most watched league in terms of people who go to the stadiums in Europe. In the in North American model, they don't they don't really have that. Also, because um, the, the 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 European model in football is structured as not for profit, and both UEFA and FIFA are not for profit organisations, a very very significant amount of the surplus from uh, UEFA uh, national team competition, the Euro and FIFA competition, goes back to the grassroots. I mean, this is not an insignificant achievement. And again, the point I'm making is that th th this this should, this is the kind of argument that has to be made in in you know in in response to the people that say that a, a super league is the inevitable way forward. You know, we've got something here. 
we should acknowledge its many, many strengths. And, you know, and we should think, we should be thinking carefully about how we can develop this model further in order to keep these strengths. The other thing to say about European football is despite the 2008 crash, it's quite resilient. You know, it is, com it, 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 you know, the, 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 the revenues have continued to grow. So let me just say a little bit about the FIFA World Club. Club. I mean, I don't have any, I mean, I think FIFA have done a very good job since, um, you know, well, for many years, in fact, even despite all the corruption problems. I mean, the FIFA World Cup is a, is a fantastic competition. Um, the, the solidarity program they run currently through FIFA Forward is, is significant. But I think that the, their decision to hold a 24 team World Cup to bring in external investors, as was proposed, uh, certainly leaked in the newspapers, a competition that would essentially involve a significant number of European teams is problematic for the legitimacy of the pyramid structure. Because essentially what it is, is it, it's a competitor to the Champions League, UEFA Champions League. It may well be beneficial to participating clubs and given an opportunity to um, generate more revenue, but it's hard to see what the benefits are for continental federations like the Asian Football Confederation, for example. The proposal to bring in private investors opens the door to a closed competition entertainment business model for reasons that I'll explain on the next slide. And it's inconsistent with maintaining equilibrium in the global football pyramid system because, you know, if we have a hierarchy, if you can only organize a competition with, it, with FIFA's approval, yeah, then it, it's, it's deeply problematic if, if FIFA, as, as a sort of the guardian of this whole system at the apex, then develops a competition which is directly in competition with one of the key stakeholders. And it... it yeah. Then five minutes, five yeah. minutes to conclude. It's okay for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think that the the, the difficulty is that if you, you know once you start bringing in uh, private investors into the system, um, you know their their position is that they are um, philosophically they are for profit, and private investment in sports competition leads inevitably to a closed North American model in sport, and we're going to see that uh, you know tested in the rugby world. Now moving briefly on to the to the Premier League. Um, the Premier League is a, is a very, very successful competition. It, um, it generates very, very significant, you know, the highest revenues in Europe. And it does this because it had, you know, very early on, it had a very clear strategy of internationalization. Um, they knew they wanted it to, to have a revenue gap with the other um, leagues. And um, which allowed them to hire the best talent and to, to, to generate a virtuous circle. And I think the reason I bring this point up is that in all this debate, one of the things that we need to be focusing on is the big clubs and underperforming national leagues, say, for example, Serie A. Also, rather than just looking to um, a restructured Champions League to generate new revenue, they need to think about how to reform their own, their own leagues to catch up with the Premier League. And... Um, you know, if this is a quote from Javier Tebas from La Liga four years ago, he says, we hope to grow so the Premier League does not become the biggest competition in the world and we can be at the same level economically. If we fail to do this, the Premier League could become the NBA football. So another thing about this whole model is, is that the actual, the, you know, to be very provocative, what's to stop the Premier League saying, you know, 13, eight of the top 20 rev highest revenue clubs in Europe are ready for the Premier League. Why don't they just invite the other eight, the other twelve teams and in, in, in top revenue teams, and they become they become the breakaway league. And you see, this is the difficulty when we have a situation where different actors within the hierarchy, for example, FIFA, start, um, you know, enter into competition with different stakeholders. The 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 the, 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 the competition becomes unstable. Um, just very briefly, uh, John Francois, I know I have to wrap it up. Even though the Premier League is, is, is the highest revenue league in Europe and was, had a very, very even distribution of, of TV distri revenue distribution in order to ensure match day uncertainty, the, this wasn't enough for the big clubs in the Premier League, who in October uh, plans were, 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 were leaked about this project big picture, which basically would involve the restructuring of the league, whereby the six biggest clubs would essentially control it and where they would also have a higher level of control over their international broadcasting rights, 
which would actually make the league le less balanced, but would also strengthen their position when performing in Europe. Now, again, this is fundamentally destabilizing to, to the system and, you know, is, is a move in a direction towards an entertainment business model of sport. Now, very briefly at the very, very end, I mean, I am sympathetic to the way that UEFA have organized uh, European football over the last 20 years. I think it's a very, very difficult job to try to satisfy all the different stakeholders. I think they've been particularly innovative on the... Uh, the competition development. I mean, the UEFA Europa League is an, is an extraordinary improvement on the UEFA Cup. I think the new Conference League could be quite interesting. Um, we don't know what is actually going to happen at the moment because there's been so much rumour. But one thing I would say, and Neil my colours to the mast on this, is, I mean, I think that to move away from the principle of access to European club competitions via sporting merit towards one where clubs just automatically are admitted because they are part of a an historic aristocracy of European yeah. football is fundamentally inconsistent with the European model of sport based on promotion and relegation and teams rising and falling on the basis of, um, of sporting merit. Um, and I think what it does is it, 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 it's a move towards a, it would, it, if, it, if, it was, if it was to pass, it would be a move towards a semi-closed league and a potential, a potential pathway to a closed North American style entertainment business model. Now, how can we deal with this? Because today we were asked to put forward some proposals. I mean, I, I personally think that um, um, a fundamental challenge to how you can enable clubs from leagues outside the big five to achieve financial scale is, you know, you have to be able to provide more, um, you know, to have more competitive intensity. I mean, one option is you, you have to you have to let, allow those uh, leagues to have a, have a bigger scale. If you look at the third point there, you know, non, uh, clubs in the non-big five leagues to achieve scale might, might be, the only way this can really be achieved, I think, is through, or might be achieved is the establishment of regional cross-border leagues in order to create bigger uh, broadcasting markets at sufficient scale. I mean, if you, if you have a look at the recent European leagues publication, it, 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 there's, a, there's a very interesting chart in there that says that, uh, you know, the bigger the GDP in a country, the more likely there are to be big clubs which are in the Champions League. So to conclude, you know, how would I finish? I think if the European model of sport is to, if football is to continue, then all the state, stakeholders need to respect the integrity of the hierarchy. And if they don't, if, it, if, if basically it, it degenerates into a turf war over who's going to control the competition that has the most big clubs in it, then I think a North American style European football Super League uh, becomes very likely. Um, I think a problem with this is if elite football in Europe adopts an entertainment business model and this raises questions for the European Union institutions in regard to how the concept of specificity, specificity of sport may apply going forward because we're no longer talking about a social model of sport, we're talking about a pure entertainment business model. Personally, I think on the second point, the possible creation of cross-border regional European leagues for promotion relegation to the constituent national leagues should be investigated with teams from those competitions qualifying for UEFA club competitions. So it will allow you a suboptimal size leagues like Belgian Juba League and Dutch Eredivisie to scale up their broadcasting markets to be on an equal footing with the big five. I mean, I think that the national leagues have to take some, you know, have to take some responsibility. You know, I mean, I was a skeptic about the Premier League but you know something, there's twice as many people attending Premier League games or elite uh, first division games in England now as there were in 1992. And the prices are much higher. I would just conclude by saying it's the ecosystem that really adds value. But one of the challenges at the moment is that the vision put forward by still Tano and people who think like them is very coherent and it's very, very clear. And people can understand it. And it has a certain internal logic. The, the argument for the European model is much more complicated to get across, but it's, it's, it's an argument that must be made. Um, but the model, the model has to evolve. It has to be evolved, and it can't simply be about saying we need to take more money from the very successful uh, Champions League and spread it around. It has to look at other parts of the hierarchy where value can be added. So um, apologies for overrunning. But I hope that you find that reasonably interesting. 
Thank you, Shams. Thank you. No worries. Uh, just five minutes late or so four minutes late. It's okay. Uh, very interesting presentation, and there, there are some some topics that will uh, be uh, addressed by the presentation of uh, this afternoon's uh, panel. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so we are going to uh, to uh, to welcome uh, now Fabio Wagner from uh, Mainz University and Thomas Koneke from the Catholic. University of uh, Leuven. Uh, thank you. You have the floor for 20 minutes now. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I think you can hear me now. Um, Fabio is sharing his screen and he will also do uh, most of the heavy lift lifting. And uh, I'm just here to briefly introduce, uh, first of all, myself and then what we're doing. As has just been said, I've been a professor for sport management at KU Leuven uh, for yeah, pretty much exactly two years now. And we are always told to emphasize that we are not supposed to be called Catholic University anymore. So it's actually KU Leuven now. Beforehand, um, I worked in, yeah, that's no problem. I know nobody knows. And I actually like the bigger name uh, better, but nobody asked me before they changed it a few years back. So. Um, all right, but anyways, um, before coming to KU Leuven, um, I, was, I worked in Germany where I also obtained my PhD and, and a postdoctoral degree called Habilitation at the University of Mainz. And this is how Fabio and myself met because we were colleagues at the University of Mainz. And it's also where the project that uh, he's presenting today um, started. And, and this is his PhD thesis, or most of it is, is related to his PhD, which is why, as I said, he's doing most of the heavy lifting. Um, and my research interests, maybe uh, as, a, as a background on myself as well, um, I'm interested in socioeconomics of sports and events and um, also on sustainability. I've been working on that topic for two years now in esports, which is rather, rather new for me. That's also linked to a PhD topic. And then, of course, regulation and governance. And uh, yeah, some people say that's because my uh, wife is a lawyer. I don't think that's true. But still, uh, this, uh, this is uh, good for some interesting discussions. Well, as I said, it's mainly Fabio's um, PhD project we're uh, presenting today. So I'm passing the word on to Fabio. Go ahead, please. So thank you, Thomas. I hope you all can see now um, the screen. Mm -hmm. um, it's OK. Um, OK, so I'm very happy to present the study today. My name is Fabio Wagner. I'm a PhD student at the Sport Economics Department at Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz. And the goal of our contribution today is to grant contribute the knowledge about the competition in the top um, European football leagues in order to better access the current situation and make some regulatory and managerial um, recommendations. On the table um, here, we can see the champions of the big five dated from which all leagues um, have played with the three point rule. Um, we already can identify some dominating, dominating clubs. If we have um, a closer look at the past 10 years without the last season, 2009-2020, the dominating four out of five leagues will become even clearer. The Bundesliga had two different champions, um, Bayern Munich won their eight title in a row. The same is Juventus uh, in Italy. They won the nine um, championship in a row. In the Premier League, we had four different champions in this investigation period. In La Liga, uh, in Liga, uh, five different champions, but um, five times PSG. And in La Liga in Spain, we have three different champions and seven times. Barcelona. And today we want to tackle this research question, how do these circumstances affect the competitive intensity of the big five um, European football leagues? As we all know, so far um, competition oriented, oriented research on the top tier football leagues in Europe has focused on competitive balance. For us, there's also no question that a certain degree of competitive um, balance must prevail. In this study, competitive intensity, which is considered more relevant uh, in our eyes, um, is 
because the actual sporting competition um, is translated better. The concept goes back to the thoughts of Grinstead and Gerard. They defined CI as the degree of competition within a league or a tournament with uh, regards to the prize structure. Um, they, when we want to measure CI, um, it has to be taken in account all prices, um, computing the level of uncertainty, and finally weight them on the basis of their relevance. Our focus is the overall CI um, and the crucial sub-competitions. For us, the crucial sub-competitions are winning the Champions League qualification slots for Champions League and um, Europa League former UEFA Cup, and the fight against relegation, of course. There are three types of uncertainty of outcome. According to Stefan Szymanski, we are um, in the seasonal um, uncertainty here. And the weightings um, introduced by Grinstead and Gerard, they were, um, we didn't use the weightings to compare the sub competition with each other and to be able uh, to compare their contribution to the seasonal CI. How we are doing this, our general objective is to produce a numerical ex post analysis of the seasonal CI of the five leagues. To do so, we were using the recently developed and published CI index model of Thomas, um, Holger Preuss and myself which is based on a um, graphical analysis. We have here um, the square. I explain it um, very quick. We have here the starting point. Um, every team is here. Um, here are the match days. If 100% of the match days are over, all teams will be on this line between Z and M. And um, if a team goes, um, the line S to M, the team has won every match. These are the crucial points. These are the points the weakest um, team of uh, sub-competition gained. And these uh, points are really important to calculate the areas. We have different areas. Um, the area of the championship race, every team is here. Um, at the beginning of the season, teams are dropping out, but they are still in contention to the championship, uh, Champions League race, sorry, or um, in the fight for the slots for qualifying in the Europa League. If they are dropping out here, they are in the fight against relegation in this area here. And if they are um, dropping out there, they are in the back end area. We have it um, behind all these areas and then they are relegated. I will give you a short example. Here you can see the general formula to determine the value of the certain areas in the graph. And we are multiplying them by a match day ratio related to the time when a particular sub-competition is decided. And the CI indices for a sub-competition um, are afterwards um, calculated. These are added up to get the value of the seasonal index. One example, the champion has 97 points and total points are 114. So the percentage is 85.1% um, of the total amount of points. Now we can calculate um, the area for the championship race and get 1,068 units. Now we are multiplying um, this value with the match day ratio. In this example, the championship race was decided already at the 36th match day and then we get our CI index for the championship. It's 1,138 in this um, example. 
if we have a maximum um, a maximum amount of units in all areas, it would be the maximum of CI seasonal about um, 10,000 units. And if CI season is max, then also um, the competitive balance would be max because um, in this example, at the last match day, all sub competition um, will be decided. To show you um, the results, our investigation are 102 seasons of the five leagues between 1999 and 2019. This figure presents the overall and uh, the overall overview of the seasonal CI indices for the five leagues during the investigation period. It's a bit like a jungle, but I hope you can follow the lines. As can be seen, all um, seasonal CI indices are in a corridor above 7,000 and CI values of 9,500 was only exceeded twice um, in this area by the Bundesliga in the season 2000-2001 and League A 2002 and 2003 until the season 2011-12, all indices have been above 8,000. And since then, they have frequently fallen below this level. Overall, a decrease in seasonal CI um, can be observed in all leagues by looking at the respective um, linear trend lines. Also, um, the R squared showed no significance um, we have the Premier League, the green line um, stands out with a strictly lower negative um, gradient, but it also stands out because it starts with the lowest CI in the first season. Of all, the most intense league um, under investigation was League A and the Last was the Premier League. On this slide here, um, we can see the comparison of average indices of the last decade. As you, we can see, and the results of the last decade and the 11 seasons before. And um, it clearly shows that there is a decrease in seasonal CI. In the Premier League, the difference is only and 117 index points and the most um, substantial change is um, found in La Liga with 791. Furthermore, the table shows the minimum and maximum values of CI index in the big five. And the maximum was reached um, by the Bundesliga and the lowest um, CI was detected in Serie A in the season 2013-14. It is striking here that the maximum indices um, were generated in the seasons 2001-2 um, and the season 2000-2002-3 uh, and the minimum values are in more or less in the latest years in all five leagues. We also want to show which sub-competition contributes to the seasonal um, CI. And this I will show on this slide. Um, for all seasons, the main index of the sub-competition Europa League, EuroLeague, is closest to the theoretical maximum of 2,500, which a sub-competition can gain. For this um, competition, the Bundesliga has the highest mean index and uh, the Premier League the lowest. The sub-competition Champions League is the competition with the second highest average MCI index in all of the leagues. And furthermore, the competition 
um, of avoiding direct relegation uniformly gains the third highest um, average value. The championship um, race, which is um, always um, the first um, box plot, provides the smallest contribution to the overall CI. Moreover, the values of the subcompetition championship show a much wider range than those of the others. The most are also lower. Therefore, um, the changes um, in the championship race provides the main explanation on the overall decline of the seasonal CI and the subcompetition Champions League, Euro League, and the fight against relegation produced relatively, relatively constant indices over the years under investigation. Now we want to discuss a few points. Um, yes, the question is, is competitive balance even the goal uh, of... Uh, yes? Five minutes to conclude, it's okay for you. Okay, thanks. So the overall question for us is um, the competitive balance, even a goal of regulation in European football and desirable? If yes, we have adjust the price money of the UEFA competitions, adjust the national contribution keys of broadcasting revenues and um, a lot more. We think due to the pavilion conditions in European um, football, CI is the more relevant construct um, than competitive balance. And um, despite the decreasing CI that was found in our study for all leagues under investigation, the enormous spectator interest had not reached a tipping point until 2019, which can be seen um, by the continuous economic growth of the leagues before the pandemic. This indicates um, for us that the level of CI is still perceived as um, sufficiently high and star, star player effects, um, David versus Goliath uh, attraction and post championship glory factors probably make up for declining CI in the championship race. The UEFA um, Europa Conference League, which will come in the next season, will increase um, the domestic seasonal CI and the European Super League would strengthen, strengthen the domestic um, CI. We don't know what will happen with the attracted. It's probably um, will decline, of course, but in our model, these um, two competitions will or would strengthen, strengthen the seasonal CI. And we're coming to the last side, some uh, managerial recommendations um, from us. First of all, um, the league structure seems to work. The round robin format, equal point system for different subcompetitions um, for reaching the sporting prices um, show that the CI is still healthy for the big five. League managers um, have to create at least one opponent as for the dominating teams we saw at the beginning of the presentation. Um, one regulatory recommendation would be to adjust the national contribution um, of broadcasting um, revenue in favor for the second place finisher, at least. The results support also the idea um, of a four-class society in a league. So we are moving away from a total global competitive balance to a um, um, local competitive balance in each of the four sub-competitions. Moreover, domestic leagues um, should use their influence on UEFA to ensure that the competition um, UEFA 
Euro League remains as attractive as possible for the clubs and for the supporters to cheat the prize money kick off times as some team managers have already stated that they would better off by not qualifying for the Euro League because the Euro League was um, the sub competition with the highest contribution to the seasonal CI. So thank you um, very much. We're looking forward to uh, inspiring discussion and also looking forward to comments from your side. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Fabio, for presenting uh, us this uh, very interesting topic. Uh, we are going to launch the debate and uh, we have the chance to uh, to have today uh, some representatives uh, of FIFPRO because we have uh, discussed uh, a lot about uh, players uh, since the beginning of the day. And uh, I wanted to, to welcome Loic Alves, uh, who is a legal counsel uh, at uh, Fifth Pro, uh, maybe Loic, you can just uh, have a brief uh, reaction on the presentation uh, made by uh, Fabio and Sean, uh, and either on other topics. For example, uh, we've discussed uh, on the first panel uh, on the topic regarding the strategies, uh, which uh, are based on the uh, player trading, uh, which is very, very, which are very developed today. Uh, so, what's your point of view on that topic? And after this uh, reaction, maybe you could, uh, as uh, Alex Phillips uh, did, uh, propose some uh, elements regarding uh, uh, regulation. Uh, what are uh, uh, principles or what are the main uh, uh, elements that FIFA Pros uh, wants to, uh, to, uh, to implement in the professional football? Thanks, Christoph. Uh, can, you, can you hear me properly? No, sure. OK. Um, yes, yes, perfect. Okay, yeah, so a bit of background. Yeah, my name is Loic Alves. I work for FIFPRO as an in-house counsel. Uh, and beforehand, I was actually in, in the European Handball Federation. So I have also a bit of an experience from the uh, federal world. Um, I start by quoting or like kind of repeating what Alex said, which is never a bad idea. I think uh, I'm not an academic, so it's more like as a practitioner that I, I give like some comment. It's really broad. Um, I, I was quite interested in the last, Sean, I was interested in your presentation as well, but I was interested in the last one because I was, I was trying to figure out like to what extent would it be possible to really kind of connect the question of competitive balance, financial stability and the governance models, like to what extent one can influence and impact the other. And then I start with, with Sean's discussion on, on the pyramids. Uh, first, I'm not really sure if it still looks like a pyramid and what we see from a player's perspective very often is that it might well be true that UEFA and even like FIFA are doing like a pretty good job at including stakeholders into their discussions, um, but it's doubtful if this model is mirrored at the lower level. And we're also discussing mainly like the top five leagues, which I understand like data are more available. This is what uh, um, is the strongest financial uh, models we have, but what we deal with at FIFPRO is way broader and um, more often than not, these governance principles are not really uh, reflected uh, at the national level. So to be very concrete, what we saw during the, the, the COVID pandemic is that all those beautiful social dialogue discussions, well, they, they didn't happen outside of the big league. And also more often than not, what we see is that when there is financial stability and a strong governance model that is inclusive towards stakeholders, not just players, uh, but in general, um, then the league is sound and then solutions are found. Uh, well, while actually where there is financial instability, not to talk about competitive balance, because I, as I said, I'm not really sure how to connect that yet, but where there is financial instability, working conditions are poor and governance models are not really inclusive. Um, now, what I'm also wondering is what kind of measures uh, we, could, we could propose. And Alex's proposal is interesting, the standard contract. I agree with that one, of course, but the standard contract implies uh, that there is, there is like social dialogue and collective bargaining. 
and that you even have the stakeholders to discuss about it. I know that Dennis Gudasic is here. We have this discussion quite often. How representatives are most of our clubs unions or players unions or any league sometimes? Do they know, do they really represent someone? Are they entitled to be at the table even at the, at, at, at the first time for the um, most of the time? Um, and also, and now I'll be quite critical, um, let's talk about national federation. They have had their chance to be inclusive and to try to regulate their market. Of course, in some markets, leagues are doing it pretty well. But again, I'm, I'm mainly talking about uh, leagues we, we, we don't hear about very often. Those federations, they pass rules, they implement rules, and they enforce the rules, and they are not inclusive. And their markets, financially, are not doing really well, and their stakeholders are left aside. So this is where I'm struggling a bit with the with the pyramid model. Um, I don't think it's very efficient everywhere. So now to discuss the measures, um, there is probably a need for more enforcement of social dialogue at the national level. And this could be done by a different regulatory uh, tools that we, we have. And, 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 and UEFA is aware of it. And, and it's not actually about criticizing anyone uh, because we all know it, but then there's a political reality and we get stuck um, because we know what could be done. We know how it should work to have all those elements um, worked on together. So maybe like a first measure and it wouldn't be too complex on paper uh, is, is simply to enforce a stakeholder management model at the domestic level. And if it's not respected, then you could think about, I don't know, uh, licensing system uh, regulations uh, to enforce for mm. a couple of sanctions, for instance. Um, same, a European standard contract would also be a good starting point, but it also implies that it has to be enforced at the domestic level. And then about player trading, mm. well, we see that every stakeholder is kind of struggling with, with providing a proper answer on that. Um, it starts at the very top and we all know that like fixed term contracts are the norm for as long as fixed term contract will be the norm player trading will be here. Uh, loans will, will be reduced, uh, which is, which is an, in our opinion, a good starting point. Uh, it's not a, it's not an end point obviously, because we know that with multiple club ownership, clubs will find a way around to use the, the maximum number of loans and maximize it. Um, so yes, there is definitely something to be done around player trading. The issue we have is that players are, it's not the, the issue that players are moving. It's more that their working conditions are decreasing in markets where the financial stability is, is not. And I don't know if there is a connection with player stability, uh, with uh, trading. But what is sure is that contractual stability, which was one of the, of the main objectives in 2001 when the negotiations took place between the commission and the stakeholders, is not really there. Can we say that like a, a player has contractual stability when most of the time he's signed for one or two years, more often one year than two. And player trading is also an issue in the top five leagues. I'll, I'll, I'll conclude on that. So it is one problem, but for FIFA it's not like the main one because what we see in data show that most players move freely out of contract. And then in the top five leagues, where there's a concentration of, of power and of, of um, finances, um, there, it's, there is trading. Other than that, it is not really the main uh, issue. Okay. I, I hope I kind of... No, no, Loic, just maybe uh, because there, 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 were, uh, there was a comment uh, on the chat uh, regarding your idea to enforce uh, social dialogue at national level. Uh, and Thomas uh, asked uh, if it was, uh, it should be done um, within sports or uh, with an uh, external actor. Uh, what do you think about that? Loic? We can't hear you. Thanks. I couldn't unmute myself. 
sorry. Um, no, I, I, uh, we need a mix for sure. It's, it's, I, I will draw a, a very easy uh, analogy. Uh, the fight uh, against match fixing. Uh, there is a need for cooperation between public and, and, and private entities. And of course, the sports sector can try to, to, to be the first uh, to have the first impulsion and the first try at it. But if we could have uh, yeah, government supporting it, that would help. Um, now this is like easier to say than to do. But for sure, the last let's say, I don't know, 10 to 15 years have shown that trying to do it on, on, on our own as the sports sector was not fully convincing. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wanted to, to, to give the floor now to uh, Rob Simons, uh, who is a, a professor, uh, economics uh, pro professor at uh, Lancaster University, um, to have his reaction on the, the, the topics that we discussed uh, previously. So Rob, uh, what do you think about that uh, regarding uh, maybe uh, the, the, the competitive balance or competitive intensity? How could we uh, improve uh, the things uh, in professional football? What's your point of view on that? Okay, thanks very much uh, everybody. And thanks to Jean-Francois for organizing this. Uh, I really enjoyed the presentations this morning. They've been very stimulating, uh, uh, very helpful to kind of frame ideas. Uh, there's such a lot going on in uh, in world football right now, uh, so there's a lot to kind of get hold of. Um, I've got, uh, I think, three points, uh, which are fairly broad. Um, so starting with your question uh, there, Christoph, about competitive balance. Uh, I'm a sports economist, and I actually think that competitive balance is probably the most overplayed and overused concept in sports economics. Uh, and the reason I say that is because, uh, and I've done some work on it, um, as you've probably seen, on an audience demand. Um, when you link competitive balance to outcome uncertainty, they're not the same thing, but they are related. Uh, fans don't seem to be all that concerned about competitive balance or outcome uncertainty, it seems to me. We've already had examples um, from the presenters uh, where leagues have been dominated by dynasties, uh, yet uh, the audience holds up. Um, it doesn't decline. Uh, Premier League has been like that. Um, German Bundesliga, despite Bayern Munich's dominance and so on. So a quick uh, comment on competitive intensity is that this is indeed a more interesting concept to me, but I would get the originators to make that a bit more forward-looking uh, to see what the expectation of performance is going to be. An example I would give you is Leicester City, which has popped up already. The interesting thing there was not just that they won the Premier League in 2015-16, but in the middle of the season, no one really believed they would. Uh, they thought Leicester would, majority view of commentators, and I think fans as well, maybe Leicester fans had a different take, uh, was that Leicester would collapse. Uh, they would not sustain uh, the top place uh, till the end of the season. And it took a long sort of period through the season uh, before, as it were, the penny dropped that this club was for real and that they were going to do it. Uh, so I think to kind of capture that within competitive intensity uh, would be a good idea. Make it more forward-looking. Perhaps use the betting market, uh, because I think that's a good guide to expectations there. And then going back to Sean's contribution, which I really enjoyed, and I, I agreed with just about everything, especially the emphasis on promotion and relegation. Uh, I do like that, uh, and I think that's important. But at the very top of the pyramid, you've got FIFA. Uh, I'm a critic of FIFA, uh, to be clear. And I especially am critical of the way that FIFA and the World Cup kind of intrudes upon the domestic schedule. And it does so in a rather inefficient way, I think. So I'm not a particularly an England fan. I'm one of the least patriotic uh, people you could meet. Uh, but uh, coming up soon, we have the World Cup qualifiers for 2022 Qatar. 
England gets to play San Marino and Andorra in its group for qualifying. So that's four games that have to be played as a national team and integrated into the uh, domestic calendar. To me, that's four games wasted, quite frankly. Uh, no disrespect to San Marino or Andorra. Uh, I think that whole competition is bloated. Uh, mm. And I think there is a tension here between FIFA and UEFA where each organization is uh, seeking surpluses, rents as we call it in economics. Uh, and I think that's an overdone competition. And of course, the downside of this is on the players. The players experience fatigue when they play for the national team as well as for their uh, domestic teams in domestic uh, competition. So I think something we should be careful about is the value of the players themselves and their ability to perform in various competitions and the sort of cliche that there's too much football, I think is actually valid here. Uh, and I think it needs to be looked at. And finally, um, a quick comment about uh, lower division football, uh, which is the other end of the pyramid. How is that going to be sustained, especially uh, during and after the COVID uh, pandemic? Because in England and elsewhere, you've got uh, divisions, uh, whole divisions, where teams do not have access uh, to uh, broadcast income. They don't have their games televised uh, and they're reliant on gate receipts. And if there's no gate, there's no gate receipts. Uh, and that's what we've got in uh, large parts of England and Scotland right now, uh, and indeed in Germany and I guess in France also. So what's the subsidy mechanism for keeping those um, lower division clubs, if you think the pyramid should be kept intact? And I think that's something that needs to be addressed as well. I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. Uh, I've seen that Stefan Szymanski, uh, who will present uh, just after, after the lunch, uh, has put a comment in the chat, and I wanted to, to ask him to, to explain what he said uh in the chat so stefan do you want to to explain us what your what's your point of view regarding imbalance and uh the, the fact that you should you think that it's linked to the promotion and relegation system uh <clears throat> thank you christoph yes and uh thank you for organizing this wonderful event um uh, this is this is great uh opportunity to talk um i yeah the, the the two talks this morning um have well both i agree with rob i think they're both very interesting and um like rob i agree with with uh, many things that uh, from both speakers the point i want to make is that we talk about promotion and relegation and its uh and its strengths and how much we like it as a system and we talk about competitive imbalance as that's uh, competitive balance as this is an important issue. And we talk about these things as if they are, are somehow unconnected, but they're not uh, unconnected. These two things go together. And to understand that, you have to look at the structure of American leagues and the way that closed leagues work uh, over here. And closed leagues can promote competitive balance by sharing revenues and uh, uh, distributing, restricting the, the, the labor market by and ensuring players are distributed equally across the league because the teams at the top of a closed league have nothing to fear from cooperation. They're not going to get relegated because that's the nature of a closed league. In an open league system with promotion and relegation, the top teams will never want to share, will never be willing to share because they, if they do, they will they risk losing their status as a top team and being relegated. And while that's not a real threat, as long as they remain dominant, as soon as they agree to share, they risk losing their dominance, and then they risk losing, um, uh, they risk uh, relegation at some point. So this is kind of an either or situation. You can either have more competitive balance in the American style and have a closed league system, or you can have competitive imbalance, which has always been characterized, the characteristic of European soccer. This is European football has been like this, go back right to the beginning of all the leagues. Um, you look at 
uh, Real Madrid and Barcelona in Spain. You look at uh, uh, Bayern Munich in Germany. You look at Juventus in Italy. Uh, Arsenal in England. Uh, you know, Dortmund, really um, uh, consistently throughout the history of football. Really and I would argue, I think that the promotion relegation system is something that, uh, uh, as a policy matter, I would agree with Sean, it's something we want to preserve. It's something that part of our, in some sense, part of our European heritage. And it does mean we have this huge diversity of teams everywhere across Europe which um, uh, gives uh, a, a meaning to local communities, which is you know, probably one of, the, one of the most significant factors holding local communities together nowadays in Europe. And you don't have that in the United States. You don't have local teams. You don't have that kind of sense of solidarity that people have w w uh, relating to their local sports, uh, sports club. And, but, if we're going to preserve that, then we have to accept the imbalance that naturally goes along that, along with that, by having um, a uh, promotion and relegation system. So um, I'm appealing for people to think about these things together and rather than think about them um, in isolation. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe we could go back uh, to Sean or uh, Fabio and Thomas uh, just to, to react on what uh, has been said. And maybe if you have some proposals uh, to implement uh, regarding the regulation, uh, it's time to, to tell us. Um, well, one, one observation would make is that um, if you ever watch a presentation from any of the Premier League people, what they always talk about is match day uncertainty. That's what they're really, that's what they're striving for with the aggressive redistribution of the income. Because they want every match to be an event. So it's not necessary for Huddersfield to be able to win the Premier League. It's just necessary that on any given day, there's a possibility that they could meet Manchester United. And, you know, I think that, I mean, I'm, Richard Scudamore, he was very, very aggressive about this when he was the CEO of the Premier League about ensuring that they stuck with that very equitable model. And I mean, I didn't really have much time to show the quote from Deloitte, but the, whether we accept or not, they believe that that has been a significant factor in their success, that they, that they were able to achieve a level of match the uncertainty through the distribution of income. And that, that helped them to sell. The, that wasn't the only factor. I mean, star quality, uh, because they had higher wages at a higher quality of athletic standard in the league, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, the fact that they were completely international, that they resisted any kind of player quotas from the FA, which I think Brexit is going to be bad for them, in fact. Because, I mean, what they are is they're an international league that happens to be in England, because that was their strategic vision. Whereas the Bundesliga is a German league in Germany. Now, it's just a different vision. And I mean, I was in Korea a few years ago where some people in the Korean football industry were complaining to me about the Premier League because nobody wanted to buy the K-League because they wanted to watch the Premier League because it was all the Korean players. But I, I think that um, I would come back to the central point that I think that the, the Premier League had a strategy and have a strategy. And for some bizarre reason, well, not, it's not bizarre at all, it's in the, in the process of being unpicked a little bit at the moment by the, the clubs that are owned by the American owners. And I think the reason for that, which is, it seems to me the center point of the discussion today is that there are a group of investors now in European football and their vision is a closed North American model. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, it, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vision. Because they, they see the way, and I think the first thing they will do is they will get rid of promotion and relegation. And I think Stefan is absolutely correct. Once they've done that, they'll have their they'll have their salary cap and the redistribution because they won't they won't they won't have the potential financial instability of uh, relegation. But I think the central point for us today is that if that if that vision is really becoming compelling, you know, what do we actually want? I, I mean, instead of it. You know, I mean, I, I always felt, you know, I do a lot of work for UEFA, so maybe they expect me to say this. I always thought a lot of the criticism of UEFA was a bit unfair, really, because, you know, what have they done? They, they've, they've created really, really successful competitions. 
And now people are arguing about the distribution of the spoils. I mean, that's what it's about. And I think that the, state, the stakeholders that feel the system isn't working for them, they need to think a bit more clearly. That's why I'm interested in regional leagues, because I think that the bottom line is if you're in Holland, you're in, you're, you're in a 17 million broadcasting market, Germany's 80 million. You know, even if you get into the Champions League, you're 63 million set of eyeballs short. You know, the, 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 I just think that it doesn't matter how you organize the redistribution of income in the next cycle in terms of solidarity or in terms of an access list. Glasgow Celtic and Glasgow Rangers are still going to struggle because they're in a small broadcasting market. And, you know, the other thing about just as an aside, I mean, I know there's a view in the academic world that competitive balance is, is not, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, Rob, about competitive balance, but if you read the European League's document that came out last Friday, I mean, they're obsessed with competitive balance. They, the league organizers themselves think that having a high level of competitive imbalance means it's more difficult to sell the, the league to broadcasters. So, I think to come back to what we're trying to do, what is this? If you, if you do believe that there is a future for the European model in football, then you, you have to come up with a, a model that allows big teams and small markets to have a realistic chance of competing in the Champions League. And the only way that I, I can see that you can do that is to allow them to be in regional leagues with a bigger population. Yes, that, 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 that's an interesting point. Uh, uh, maybe we should discuss and analyze the possibility to create such a yes, cross-borders competition uh, in order to, yes, to increase uh, the size of the markets. Uh, maybe one other point, uh, if we want to, to tackle or to, to manage the, the, the fact uh, the competitive imbalance uh, would be to maximize uh, the revenues that are collected by the leagues or by the, the federations, uh, because we know that uh, what uh, drives competitive imbalance and what drives uh, com maybe financial imbalance is that uh, money uh, is going to big clubs and big players. So maybe if we could, I don't know if it's a good, good position or good, good, good option, but maybe if we could create a system where uh, revenues are, um, uh, yes, uh, collectively so, um, sold or collected by leagues, and then uh, with some, some mechanisms of distributions that uh, uh, promote solidarity and uh, equi equality, maybe it could it could be a way to manage yeah, this. But the, but the clubs have got to believe in the leagues. I mean, I mean, to go back, to, I think Stefan is absolutely yeah. right about, you know, what he what he you know he's talking about the clubs pursuing a particular form of self interest. I mean, the reason why they you know, the day Scudamore left, almost immediately the big clubs negotiated a bigger share of the international broadcasting rights. The reason it didn't before, I believe, is because they believed in Richard Scudamore's vision for the Premier League. And, mm. you know, it, it comes down to it. And I mean, what is League One's vision? I mean, you know, for I mean, I know a lot about Serie A, right? Serie A was the number one league in the 90s. What is it, number four? It might even be number five. You know, they're, they're playing the Italian Super Cup in Saudi Arabia when Saudi Arabia, according to WTO, is organizing an industrial scale piracy of, of you know, the broadcasting of Syria through being in Qatar. I mean, you know, the, the league, the league, yeah, yeah but it's, it's, I mean, it's not just about economics, it's, it's about business strategy and about, you know, what are the strategic objectives of the league? I mean, the, the American leagues seem to me they have coherent strategies. Yes, apart, sure. apart from the Premier League at the national level, I mean, what are the coherent strategies of leagues in Europe? Yeah, that's an important point. <laughs> uh, another another thing that you said, and and maybe Fabio will will take the floor ne next. Uh, you said that. Uh, 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 one of the issues what the, the, the new arrival or the new investors uh, coming to clubs, and I think that it is a real uh, topic, uh, and we have some things like that in France uh, with uh, private funds, uh, investment funds that are owning uh, clubs. Uh, and you, that, yes, I think that it is an important point, uh, which, is, which explains that 
uh, we are going or the pressure is increasing regarding the creation of super leagues or, pre or, or closed leagues. But I don't want to, to, to tackle this issue because it will be discussed uh, this afternoon. But maybe we should also have a look uh, regarding the, the capital or the, the owners of clubs. Uh, who are they? Uh, should we fix some limits? Uh, uh, should we fix some, yes, uh, uh, obligations uh, regarding uh, uh, national investors or associations or uh, amateur, the amateur sector? Maybe it's, a, it's another point to address. Fabio, I don't know if you want to address that. Maybe, maybe I can I can step in here. Yes, Thomas. Um, yes. Oh. Yeah, because uh, this is a very broad question. I think also the the discussion we are seeing today, and I mean the many very different contributions, which is why I actually think this is a great format. Um, it shows that that we are actually dealing with a very very broad topic. And um, as I said, I mean I'm originally from Germany. I worked in Germany for quite a while. Now I'm working in Belgium. And I mean, in Belgium, um, foreign direct investment into, into football is a big thing, you know? And a few years back, there was a lot of foreign investment actually in the second uh, tier Belgian Football League. And for some time, it, it has been heavily discussed. I mean, I've only been there for two years, but I can, I can follow that for a while. Um, what exactly these foreign investors want, you know? And for example, a colleague of mine who's a social psychologist, um, we are con uh, conducting two master theses at the moment, and we are looking into community engagement pro um, programs of football clubs, because we've heard that the social dialogue is one of the things that was related towards towards um, uh, players and then player transfers. But generally, I mean, social dialogue is a big issue because that's also an, an, a big difference between the European and the American sport model that in Europe, and, and based, for example, on, on what I know from Germany, um, a sport club is not, and even not a sport club like Bayern Munich, who's certainly a highly professionally organized um, um, firm, they are not considered um, to be uh, for-profit organi organizations on the one hand uh, for tax reasons, but on the other hand, it's what the people want. You know, they say, well, you cannot be the Deutsche Bank of football. That's just not something that's accepted, at least in, in German society at the moment. So I think we're really looking at a very, very broad topic. And the backdrop of, of our um, research project was the interest in the question, well, mm, is the competitive intensity actually a problem so can we say because that's that's what you read in the papers all the time well Bayern Munich is, is winning the championship all the time so it's a boring league but if you look at at the at the, at the di different sub, sub competitions or the different prizes that can be won within the league well yeah the the championship in many European league uh, leagues as, as Fabio has pointed out has become somewhat boring but you can basically say that overall there is sporting competition in the league so our point was well basically this doesn't seem to be a real big problem at the moment. So actually there is room to look at other issues. That's maybe the take home message uh, from, from our presentation also in, in regulatory terms, because um, as, as Stefan has also pointed out, and I totally agree, I mean, um, competitive imbalance is basically what you're actually striving for in sports, because if you're doing a good job, if you have a, a good uh, sporting organization, if, if you have good coaches, if you have good players, um, if you have a good youth youth program, and if you're also doing a good job in financial terms, what do you want to achieve? You want to be the best. You want to win championships. You want to, in, in, in football, you want to, to move on to the European uh, league system or to the European um, competitions and, and ideally win the Champions League. I mean, that's what you're striving for. And then the question always is, and, and this is inherent to sport, do you actually want to punish the clubs that are doing things, well, optimally by taking money away from them and also looking, for example, again, at Germany, you can, uh, you also have to ask the question when we're talking about the redistribution of funds, which mm -hmm. funds can you redistribute? You can redistribute media funds, but for example, Bayern Munich, I mean, they, they are also uh, the, the, by far uh, the best in, in uh, obtaining sponsoring monies and, and so on and so forth. So yeah, that's, it's, it's not, it's not really easy. And then, and I think that's a key difference to the, to the American close league system. We have the national and we have the, the international, we have the European competitions. And I mean, that's also something you can see. And this is why I think Corona is very interesting from, from an academic perspective. Also, you can see how teams, how top teams in national leagues, how they prioritize, you know, which players they use, for example, in the champions league and which ones they then use in, in, in domestic competitions. So again, I think, yeah, it's a very, very broad um, uh, discussion that we're also seeing here. And I think one of the things that European football has been struggling with for quite a while is actually prioritizing, you know, to actually ask, 
well, or have a, have an open discussion about what you actually want and which which questions you want to tackle first, which we're also seeing today, because as I said, wide variety of questions. Um, and I think this is probably something that I take uh, with me from today, even even more than than I had thought of or thought of before or thought about before. That this is probably the, the question of prioritizing. Also, after after the COVID pandemic, I think this is going to be one of the real big issues in European football that hasn't really been discussed in past years. Okay, now I think I've talked too long. <laughs> Sorry for Can that. Can I very briefly add something to that? Yes, very briefly. Yeah, very, yeah. One of the things that's happened now is that all these investment funds are looking to, you know, buy distressed assets, basically. So, you know, a lot of leagues are in trouble. You can only sell your league, you know, your league one. I mean, in, this is what, what, in rugby union, for example. Now, what they will do, like CBC Capital, what they will do is if they take control of a competition, they will just replicate the American model. Now, maybe that's what we want. I mean, I personally don't want it, but you know that's why this debate is so critical because you know we could be end up debating the thing, and before we know, half the leagues in Europe are controlled by investment funds anyway. Yeah, I think yeah, you're both right. you're both right. We we need to 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 make choice, and we need to to fix some priorities, and that's maybe we are we have a too broad analysis. Uh, I, I wanted to to give the floor to Marcus if Marcus is uh, okay. Uh, because uh, there is a, a very interesting debate uh, in the chat, and uh, may maybe Marcus could react to what uh, Stefan said and explain us uh, what's he, what is his point of view. Um, you know, uh, kind of again, what I what I stated before in the session before. Um, uh, I think we are still. It's kind of puzzling. What is our value orientation? What are you know the benchmarks we, we are looking for? There, of course, there is imbalance, and I completely agree with uh, Stefan that um, this is uh, inherently so. This is when when we prefer the model of promotion relegation, when we prefer these um, uh, the, the uh, hierarchical model that Sean was nicely presenting again. So then, if if we want this um, European model of of sports. Uh, then we always have this problem of um, relatedness between the uh, institutions and the regulations. But, uh, you know, there, um, uh, to me, there is a key value judgment towards a certain diversity, uh, towards a certain equal chance that also small countries, small leagues from time to time have the, uh, have the chance to, um, to compete on, on a, not, it mustn't be the same level, but on a good level. So the key value of integrity of competition, um, this is actually in, in my observation of the debate in the, of the public debate and the debate among fans is uh, that they wish, uh, you know, more chances also for, uh, for the small clubs and small leagues, at least the chance of catching up of, 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 uh, of uh, creating from time to time a, a market dynamic which is challenging the big clubs. And that is the point. And now uh, more and more there is the impression, well, there are no chances at all anymore for uh, a Red Star Belgrade or uh, clubs like that uh, with a great tradition to really challenge uh, Man City with, uh, with the uh, uh, investors funds. Thank you, Marcus. Um, thank you very, for the, this very interesting debate and uh, the, the elements that we discussed about. It's very interesting. Uh, unfortunately, we have to 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 find to, to finish uh, now. Uh, thank you, everybody, and I will give the floor to Jean-François just to finish and to to present uh, uh, this afternoon uh, sessions. Yeah, thank you very much, Christoph. Thank you, everyone, because I, I really enjoyed the discussions and the debate. Uh, that's exactly what we, what we expected and what is really lacking in the more formal um, university seminars that are really, really boring, in my opinion. So I really like the discussions. Thank you, everyone, for being involved. Um, hopefully, this is going to 
is going to be continued this afternoon. Um, we're going to have Stefan Szymanski presenting his, uh, his kind of revolutionary measure uh, at uh, 10 past 2 uh, French time. And then afterwards, we have a whole session uh, where, in which we will tackle the, the Super League, the Super League, the Pan-European Leagues. So some, some, it, it was already mentioned sometimes, and we're going to have a whole session to talk about it. So yeah, so let's all have a nice lunch. Stefan, yeah, 20 minutes. Yeah, really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Jean-Francois, and uh, thank you, and uh, thanks to CWS for um, organizing all of this. It's a wonderful event, and um, the one and only benefit, I think, of COVID is this ability to uh, meet internationally. Um, I will say good morning from Michigan. Uh, the sun finally has come up over here, so um, uh, I'm feeling a little bit more awake, and I'd also uh, thank the organizers for allowing me to start a little bit later so that um, I could at least have some coffee before I go going. Um, so I, I want to talk about my, so you can see my slides, I think. I want to talk about a simple suggestion that I have for the organization of football in Europe. Um, we are sometimes guilty, and I am guilty as anyone, of talking in very grand terms about principles and organizational structures and how we think should be things things should be done and sometimes i think this leads us to ignore some of the sort of more fundamental um nuts and bolts of the way that football or sports are organized and some of the basic problems that teams face and that's where my talk comes in i think that there is actually a, a fairly basic fundamental problem with european football that is actually addressed rather simply and i want to explain um how how that can be done in this talk um uh and it feeds into something that i've been suggesting for a little while now which predates covid but actually uh has relevance i think within the context of covid as well so the main problem i think that people often neglect in football and in sport in general is the problem of risk and risk is not specific to football it's inherent to any enterprise i call it enterprise not business i'm not trying to say that all sport is a business or anything like that but whatever you call it a, a, a football club is an enterprise of sorts and with any enterprise you must spend money first in order to provide a good a service whatever it might be which then you hope will generate revenues which will cover those costs and there is where risk lies you do not know before you spend the money whether you're going to get it back or how much of it you're going to be able to get back if the revenues exceed the costs after the event then everything is fine but if the costs exceed the revenues then someone else is going to have to make a financial commitment to support you. I was explaining, talking to this to my American student just the other week, and one student replied to me, I can't believe how European football could work. Uh, why would anybody spend uh, or run a business which generates less revenue than it has cost? To which I said, well, yes, but people will put money in if extra money in if the business fails that's what if the if the business is not making money if the enterprise is not making money and this was a this was a shock to them but we're very familiar with this in europe we're very familiar with the idea that when there's a deficit somebody puts money in to keep the club afloat it's a very common story on the other hand if no one does come forward to uh keep the club afloat then bankruptcy follows and we also see that so that's the story of risk, which is inherent at, in sport. And whenever we talk about the need for uncertainty of outcome, well, this is a consequence of uncertainty of outcome. We all say it is, it's a characteristic of sport. Well, sure, that means that risk is a characteristic of sport and losing teams are likely to face problems. And I'm not just saying this because that sounds plausible in theory. Of course, it's 
pretty obvious in theory that that's true, but it's also actually true in practice. And here's some data to show you how true this is. Relegation risk makes a big difference. So what I have in this table are uh, three panels. The top one shows you what happens to the revenues and wages of promoted teams in the season following promotion. The middle panel shows you what happens to teams that are neither promoted nor relegated, they remain the same. And the bottom panel shows you what happens to clubs that are relegated in the season following relegation. So if you look at the middle panel first in black, you can see that actually there's a change in revenue and a change in wages which are roughly in balance. Sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less, but roughly in balance. Now look at the top panel, you can see that the change in revenues depends far greater than the change in wages. Um, that's the benefit of being promoted. There's a sudden windfall in revenues and wages don't rise by as much. Then look at the bottom panel, which I've highlighted, which I've circled in green. You can see that the revenues fall and the wages do not fall by, either do not fall by as much or do not fall at all. And that's not irrationality, as UEFA's financial fair play would have it. That's economic reality. When you're relegated, your revenues will collapse. That's guaranteed. What you cannot do as a club is just fire all the players or cut their wages. You can't just say to the players, I'm sorry, we've been relegated. Now you get a 50% wage cut. Well, maybe some clubs would like to do that, but that's not, if players have contracts, that's not an option that's easily available. And that's why wages don't fall. It's not irrationality, this is economic reality. And relegation risk is the main cause of financial failure for football clubs. So here's data. I've been looking at this for the last 10 years or so, looking again at data. This is data based on English clubs and the experience. In the five, what this chart shows is, is that the, in the five years leading up to insolvency, bankruptcy, because no one's willing to put more money into the club, in the five years leading up to that bankruptcy, the average club has fallen 16 places in the league. And in England, as in most countries, if you fall 16 places, you're almost certainly going to be, have been relegated. Or if you haven't been relegated, you're in the relegation zone. So they, this is what is leading to, uh, th this is the consequence of the financial risk of relegation, is that it's likely to provoke insolvency. And it does on a regular basis. And this isn't an English problem. It's not uh, a Spanish problem or an Italian problem. And it isn't a problem that some countries magically have been able to avoid through clever regulation and management of financial liability. Uh, I've looked at Germany, I've looked at France. They have exactly the same problem that England has. Well, not exactly the same. The one difference here is Germany. And Germany uh, and people who talk about the German system often like to say how great it is and how effective it is at keeping, uh, maintaining, avoiding bankruptcy and control. And that's just not true. That's, uh, that's a misrepresentation of the truth. The truth is that in Germany, there is just as much insolvency as there is in England and as there is in France. Financial regulation notwithstanding. What happens in Germany is you see very little, you see very little uh, financial failure in the top division. But that's also true in England and France. You don't, it's very rare to see clubs in the top division uh, don't become uh, insolvent. What you do see in England and France more commonly is teams at the second level becoming insolvent. And that's, that is rare in Germany. But all that the regulation in Germany does is to put shift that financial failure into the third level. And you can see if you look at the third level here in the table, Germany actually has more insolvency um, than either, uh, or the same amount as France and more than England. And lower down the levels, you can see there's insolvency as well. This is a common problem caused by relegation risk. Relegation risk because of the of 
obvious impact that it's going to have on revenues and costs is likely to lead to insolvency, and it does lead to insolvency. Now, if you accept my point that uh, relegation risk is the cause of financial instability in football clubs, then you would have to ask the question, what to do about it? Well, as people have said this morning, and as I think most of us would agree, that the pyramid itself is an indispensable part of the European system, most of us would agree that this is something we would not wish to dispense with. I've not, it'd be interesting to see, to have an opinion poll of European fans or uh, people who watch football to see what they think about this. But my guess is most people are gonna say that they want the pyramid to survive. They like promotion and relegation. It's an indispensable part of the system. And I think, uh, so I, we, I'm sure everyone here would agree with this, um, with, that, with that proposition. However, we, have, we are seeing, Currently, another yet another round of discussions about a Super League. Um, I wrote a paper with Tom Hohen about this in 1999. And even in 1999, the idea of a Super League has been around for 20 years. So this is nothing new and it may happen, it may not happen. But you can see, and people have, we've been discussing today, that there are obvious incentives to create a Super League for the big clubs because they can create a business model which will be profitable for them. And if particularly if we think of American owners, maybe thinking that profit would be a good idea in football, well then you can see what, how this might, this might happen. But we don't want a close league. I would also argue that financial fair play has largely been, uh, is, is um, not only premised on this mistaken idea that the problem with football clubs is they're irrational rather than they face uh, relegation risk, it's also a, a system which limits opportunities for smaller clubs to compete because it restricts their, their, their freedom to make choices, uh, to make their own choices, and re re restricts the ability of smaller clubs to challenge the dominance of the big clubs. Um, and it really doesn't do anything to address the financial risk of the smaller clubs for the obvious reason that financial fair play really only applies um, to the big clubs uh, anyway. Um, so neither of those points are a solution. And it seems to me the obvious point here when faced with risk and the classic solution to the problem of risk in everyday life is insurance. And I want to describe how an insurance scheme might work for, um, for football. It's very simple. Every club would pay annually a fixed percentage of revenue into the insurance pool. Then, in the event that a club faces insolvency, it's entitled to draw from the pool and claim on its uh, claim as part of its insurance. This is a very simple basic idea, which is the common standard way in all, pretty much all modern societies that, uh, uh, that we use to deal with the problem of risk. Um, I wrote, I've written about this, uh, I wrote an article for the Financial Times last year before, before the COVID crisis, just making this very, very simple point. Now, uh, when you make a simple argument like this, you people make very, have very simple objections. And the classic objection is, well, the clubs will cheat on this scheme. They'll just spend money so that they can claim on the insurance pool. Yeah, well, that is a problem. That is a problem known, it has a name, it's called moral hazard. It's the absolutely standard problem of insurance. Of course, that's a risk that you have to face up to, and you have to have mechanisms for dealing with it. But moral hazard does, if moral hazard was really the, uh, 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 the fundamental problem, the fundamental weakness of this scheme, then we wouldn't have insurance. Insurance wouldn't exist because every kind of insurance is subject to moral hazard, not just football, my football insurance scheme, but your house insurance, your car insurance, every other kind of insurance. And yet we observe that insurance is a vast global business worth 
thousands, trillions of dollars. And, there, and therefore, it clearly is possible for people to address the problem of moral hazard and run insurance schemes. So it's not really a serious objection to claim that there's moral hazard, because clearly moral hazard is something that can be dealt with. Now, how you would design this scheme is something that needs to be thought through and, and some, something that could be developed. But it's, it's really, I think, um, uh, the basic principle. I, well, I, this morning, I just want to really talk about this basic principle. Um, and then perhaps in the future, we can have more detailed discussion about how it would work. Now, as I said, I wrote about this last year because this and this scheme deals with what you would call idiosyncratic risk. So the risks that are inherent to an individual club in its own day-to-day -day existence and not a general systemic risk to uh, of, 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 the, of the whole structure. So insurance in this case works when a particular club is relegated and, be, and is risk faces the threat of insolvency and is entitled to draw it down on the screen scheme. Now, COVID-19 is, is an example of systemic risk. All of the clubs have ceased to play uh, games uh, in front of uh, their fans. And so everyone has lost revenue. And so the whole system is struggling with this. However, I think my insurance scheme would also be capable of addressing the issue of systemic risk. And indeed, in some ways, maybe we should see COVID-19 as a way of um, enabling us to uh, contemplate changes that in normal times we wouldn't have thought about. So let me describe how we might think about uh, an insurance scheme and systemic risk. So I'm gonna draw some rough conclusions from the 2008 financial crisis. Of course, it's much more complicated and there are many issues, but boiled down to its essentials, the point about the, the financial crisis in 2008 that was that banking had to survive even if some of the individual banks would not survive. And what governments and regulators decided in 2008 and the, and the, the, the following process of, uh, of um, uh, um, recovery was that it was better to uh, preserve banks by moving their loans into what was called a bad bank so that the businesses could continue once the crisis was over. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. Most of the banks survived and continued in business after the crisis. And what happens is the bank losses are essentially written off. Now, if you think about that in the context of the current crisis, if we, if we have, as, as commonly thought, many, many small clubs facing the threat of bankruptcy, there are no lenders out there who are going to bail out each club one by one on an individual basis. They would not do this um, because, again, there's um, the, the, the each individual club is just one part of the system and um, is therefore the risk will be seen by a lender as being too great. The club might fail. But lenders know that football is going to survive. Football is not going to go away. And if they believe that the system will survive, they would be willing to lend to, a, to a, an insurance fund that would bail out the individual clubs. And if you had this fund where clubs paid a percentage of their revenues into the fund, then there would be finance forthcoming to make that fund, to, make, to finance the clubs during the crisis. So there's a clear and straightforward way in which uh, we could manage the survival of the clubs through an insurance scheme. So we could do this at a national level, or we could do this at an international level. It doesn't make that much difference, I think. Uh, um, whatever's easiest, I would say. Um, and you could secure loans against assets such as broadcast rights, because football is going to survive. No one, no one doubts that. And in fact, we've seen just this month 
uh, the 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 Deutsche Fußball League raised a substantial sum of money based on the sale of future overseas broadcast rights. That's exactly what they've done, and they raised the money from private equity funds, which shows just how much there is willingness to invest in football right now, even if there there's a, might be a reluctance to bail out small individual clubs. Now, there are some issues that you need to face up to. It, it's possible that um, some clubs might try to secede from this system by forming a, uh, a Super League. Um, that might need political intervention to stop that happening. Um, but my point is that this system would, that's my time of telling me that I'm done. So I'm gonna wrap up quickly here. Um, but there is, this clearly is a system that could be made to work um, if, uh, uh, and in fact, it would work more easily in football than in many other businesses, largely because there would be a lot of political goodwill towards a collective action in football, whereas uh, collective action by uh, businesses in other industries is often subject to uh, competition law and frowned upon. So my point, so to conclude, the football system is characterized by this idiosyncratic relegation risk, which is not something we want to do away with, but something we want to find ways to mitigate. We don't want to abolish the pyramid, um, and where we want to preserve the system as we have it. The creation of insurance fund, which could be supported by a share of revenues in normal times, and by borrowing against future revenues in times of general crisis, could actually preserve uh, protect the clubs uh, while preserving the pyramid system. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Really interesting revolution is uh, is ahead of us <laughs> in football clubs. Um, there, there's a couple of questions in the in the discussion. Thank you, guys. Uh, I, I, I'm going to start because I have the floor, so I'm going to take advantage of it. Uh, but, but I'm going to use uh, ideas that were written. Uh, I was thinking um, that insurance exists in markets that are not. Um, where I mean the clients of the insurance companies are not competitors against each other you know like I take an insurance of my house of my car na, 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 na. but um, I'm not competing with my neighbor um, is it something that that may change the the idea I mean that may maybe jeopardize the idea and my other idea is um, to some extent I could decide not to take an insurance for my well, actually in, in France it's it's mandatory but I, I guess in some countries insurance is not mandatory so would clubs could clubs decide to opt out of the insurance and uh, play the I mean yeah is it something that you talked about I, I, I'll let you a minute to, to answer me and then I will ask the questions that were written in the discussion thanks Jean-Francois uh, two very good questions so Firstly, in terms of competitors, I, it, it is the, so it's true for uh, individual households. We individ, we're not competitors in some sense um, when we buy house insurance or car insurance, but there's lots of businesses where there's insurance like shipping um, and lots of other industries where you can find insurance where actually competitors do will insure themselves. So I don't think that's particularly a problem. Would it be mandatory? That is a really great question. I think my view is that, I mean, the ideal way to administer this would be through national uh, federations, through the associations, and I would make it mandatory. Um, now, um, this comes back to the issue of secession. Um, the question is, if the big clubs decide they don't want to be part of this, uh, I, since I said percentage of revenue, the amount paid in by the big clubs would be much larger than the amount paid in by the small clubs. Big clubs might not like that. And then we do get down to the politics of this. But I think that will, may, will also be the case, is also the case with the Super League. It may end up being a political issue about whether we're going to allow that to happen. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, Vladimir Andreev, you have a question? Thank you for being here, Vladimir. Okay, do you hear me? Okay. It's always a pleasure to listen to Stefan, even though it is with a social and geographical distance. So just one short point. I would characterize the current situation with the COVID-19 as 
better than systemic risk, uh, radical uncertainty. Uh, most economists are talking of radical uncertainty, a, a situation in which we have a, an absolute unpredictability of everything, first. And second, due to this, uh, even some big clubs or old clubs may, may be affected. So starting from this point, uh, my comment is that uh, I, I'm interested, of course, in this idea of an insurance fund. But uh, I don't know any insurance company or any bank which is ready to accept covering radical uncertainty and even systemic risk. And then they would accept only if there is someone which is called a lender in last resort. So you have to conceive a lender in last resort. Otherwise, your system will not work. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vladimir. I, 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 think, I think you are envisaging a very specific scheme when you when your comments, which was not necessarily the one that would 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 be needed or required in this situation. So I, as I gave the example, the the, the Deutsche Fußball League actually just rose raised from private equity substantial amounts of money based on the sale of future international broadcast rights so i'm not saying i not saying in principle they might be able to raise money or it's possible or in theory it's actually something that's happened it's a question of how you use the money but it, that, and then it comes back to your point about radical risk Maybe there are radical risks out there. We don't know what the future of the world of business is going to look like. We don't know how we're going to interact with each other. We don't know whether we're going to fly in planes or meet on Zoom or how we're going to be. But if there is radical uncertainty, one of the least uncertain things is that we're going to continue to be interested in football. That's not going away. And therefore, a scheme which is based on something which is pretty certain to be with us for the long term is a fairly safe financial bet in aggregate. And that's the problem. Football in aggregate is as safe as the Bank of England. It's clubs as individuals that are at risk. And that's why you need insurance. Thank you, Stefan. DJ, you have questions as well? Uh, yes, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Stefan. It was it is a pleasure to to discuss with you as usual. Uh, as you know, there there are some experiences in the in the eighties and the nineties where uh, clubs try to cover the risk for them uh, to miss their qualification for European competitions. And I think the idea is quite close to to those you present you presented in, in a very interesting way. But my question is, don't you think that the risk is uh, really uh, too big for the insurance themselves, uh, and especially for the club who are really under threat of the relegation uh, to, to have um, a sustainable uh, business model for the insurance or to, 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 to allow them to uh, offer uh, Low, low prices to, 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 to the club. And if prices will be high, higher and, or too, too, too high, they come back to self-insurance, in, in fact. So I think this is, for me, the main, the main problem, even if I, I was very, very interested by your, your development. And I think it's interesting to, to start with that. Thanks, thanks, Didier. And I think I think what you raise is a really important point and something I probably should have said. I, I think we need to be very clear on the scale of the problem. So the, the question is, if a club fails, how much money would it need to draw from the insurance fund? And your fear is, oh, well, it would be huge sums of money that no insurance company would would be ever uh, would be willing to cover. That's just not the fact of the way that clubs go bankrupt in Europe. So if you think Macclesfield Town went bust this year, Macclesfield Town, I don't, unless you're English, you probably have not even heard of Macclesfield Town. It's a tiny, tiny little club. 
How much was it bankrupt for? Probably less than 100,000 euros, tiny sum of money. It's not the Manchester United's or Manchester City's or Paris Saint-Germain's or Barcelona's or you know, uh, Bayern Munich's. These are not the clubs that are gonna go bust. Sure, that would be a problem, but it, it's the little clubs and the amount of money at stake is very, very small. So, so in that sense, it's not really a big issue. Bear in mind, I'm only talking about insolvency, not about things not working out for the club. I'm not talking about having to get used to being in the third division rather than the first division. That's just tough. You have to live with that. No, no bailout for that. You, the only point is if you are going to technically become insolvent, and then you would have to agree what happens to an insolvent club. And to avoid the moral hazard problem I discussed, you probably have to agree the manager has to go, the board of directors has to go. Um, and it, this would be a very, one thought that I've had about this, this would be a very good way to give fans a bigger say in the club, because one condition I would impose is 20% of the shares of the reformed club bailed out through the insurance scheme would have to go to a supporter trust. So it would be a very good way of uh, encouraging supporter trust as well. Thank you, Stefan. Baptiste Privé, you had a question as well? Yes, thank you, Jean-Francois, and thank you, Stefan, for your presentation. You said that uh, I'm a PhD student in economics and I work on the sustainable development, so that I'm not dealing with sport. Uh, you said that football pyramid is the biggest risk for bankruptcy or failure for a club. But don't you think that there could be a risk to with the insurance system, uh, with the competitions between the club and a risk to take away some club with uh, high prices in the insurance system? Because if you take too much risk, you can pay much in the insurance system, for example. So, so my and, and my scheme, you pay a, a fixed percentage of your annual revenue into the insurance scheme. Everybody does. And then, if you are faced with insolvency, which is a which is a legal technical point, right? You. It's not a, it's not a, you can't say, oh, I'm insolvent and you get the money. Insolvency is a technical legal problem that you, it's verifiable. At that point, you're entitled to draw down on the insurance fund um, in order to avoid, in, in basically in order to meet your creditors. And as I say, in most cases, these, in, in, in pretty much every case that I've ever seen, and I've looked at hundreds of these, as you can imagine, it, these are small sums of money that they need in order to maintain to prevent insolvency. So, uh, so I'm not sure what what problem are you. I, so, what's the problem with that? Where where would this be? Why would that not work? Baptiste, do you do you want to answer, or it, it, it's fine? Yeah, the, for me, the the biggest problem is that uh, I. It's okay if you take a percentage for the revenue of the club, but uh, I made the hypothesis that you can take the price higher in the in the future if you keep the club in a in a in a closed league. You know, I don't know if you want what I mean, but that was my idea. But uh, your your answer is correct, and I I take it. Okay, thank you. Is is there another question that I may have missed? Uh, you can write in the in the conversation. Sean made a comment. Uh, I don't know if Sean, you wanna you wanna have the floor. It's good. No, no. Okay, so I think we're done. Thank you very much, Stefan, and thank you everyone for having those questions. I'm sure this is gonna be a topic that's gonna be discussed about for the for the next month and maybe years. And uh, yeah, I would of course support the idea. Uh, yeah. Jean-Michel, maybe you want to have a question? Jean-Michel? Yeah. Oui. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my first question, I think it's, uh, 
in some uh, country, we have this uh, parachute system and a uh, uh, club uh, receive money during uh, one, two or three years after they uh, arrive in the second division uh, after relegation. And uh, what do you think about this system? And, and what do you think that your, your proposal is very, very interesting and very uh, innovative, but uh, what do you think about this system of uh, parachutes? And uh, second question, how can you convince a club to pay? Uh, because they, 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 they will say, sorry, it is a bad management. Uh, this club is stupid, you buy a bad player, the trainer is uh, bad. It's not uh, reasonable to ask me to pay for uh, bad management. Uh, it's sport, it's business. Uh, what is your answer? Okay, yeah, two very good points. Um, and so on the first one, um, in some sense, the parachute payment was motivated by the same idea. They were invented precisely to uh, smooth over the revenues of clubs when they were relegated. Um, uh, parachute payments have turned out to be quite a big problem in, in England in the second level because they distorted competition um, at that level, and and um, in, in some ways, it's a bad it's a bad advertisement for my proposal. But the, the fundamental difference, of course, is that my proposal is about insolvency. It's not about um, protecting, uh, a smoothing uh, a club's path. Um, I'm not. I don't have a problem if a club is relegated in successive seasons from the first to the fourth level. That's not the issue. The issue is if clubs become insolvent which is a technical legal problem, which is, um, uh, which is clearly established in law, then we need some protection for it. And this is a good way to do this. And it, to the clubs that would say um, it's bad management, well, once this scheme is established, that would no longer be relevant. Once you're part of the insurance scheme, you're part of the insurance scheme. You can't then say, oh, well, I don't agree to, to, to bail out this club. That's part of the deal. Um, if you if if I had to persuade if you asked me to persuade the clubs to join the scheme, then that's where that's where I would show them my research in the last ten years, which shows that it is not a problem of bad management. It is a problem that every club faces. It is such an inherent structural risk within football. Um, I, you know, I, people the clubs should want to join the scheme. Now, we have two answers to this, though, about how you do this. One is I have house insurance. I don't have to have house insurance, but I'm, I'm, I'm willing to have house insurance because I'm concerned that my house burns down. I have to have car insurance. That's a legal obligation. I'm not allowed to drive my car unless I have car insurance. I don't mind which model we go down. I think probably mandatory insurance through mandated by the national associations would be a better route. But you could probably manage this on a voluntary basis as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Stefan. We have a last question um, from Frederick um, Gomezulu. So please introduce yourself, Frederick, and then you can ask your question to, to Stefan. We can thank um, Frederick because he was you. very active today. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that opportunity. Um, my name is Frederick Gomezulu. Uh, General Secretary of the Football Association of Eswatini and a MESGO student um, for the current program that is ongoing. And uh, I've been taking keen interest from the very first, uh, from the very first session in the morning. Um, it's quite eventful and very interesting topics. But the specific question for, for the insurance idea would be, um, I've also, I don't want maybe to get into the issues of all the permutations, whether it is a high risk or it's possible or not. But I'm looking at a situation where we're learning from the crisis of 2008 and COVID-19 comes 12, 12 years later in 2020. Uh, we're saying what, what happens in between if maybe the, the 12 years could be taken as some sort of a hypothetical kind of standard time before you get between one and the next crisis uh, to say 
uh, could there be a certain percentage that could be reinvested back to the football clubs now purely for development activities to sort of say I've invested, I'm gaining out of the investment just in case um, it is possible between one and the next country that the insurance scheme is possible and the pyramid is possible. But then now looking at it be being an insurance stock investment kind of idea where a certain percentage could be allocated back to football development to also try and assist the clubs and also to try and balance the economic disparities that we talked about in the morning that also affect competitiveness and so many other um, scenarios that we've discussed in the morning, competitive intensity and competitive balance, there are so many of it because surely everyone wants to win into the future. If you say this specific percentage goes back to development activities that will help the specific clubs into the future to sort of try and create that balance. Uh, then the other question of whether it's going to be possible or not, that's another question. It's also a big question as to whether it is possible or not. But I want to believe personally between one and the next country, it could be possible in one, it could not be possible in the other. It could be possible at certain levels, not possible in the other as some presentations have already been made for clubs that would get relegated and, and the other issues. I think that's just about the question that I wanted to pose. Um, is there some kind of relief or some kind of assistance out of the same insurance scheme uh, back to for investment into, into football? Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. That's a, that's a very interesting question. I'm, I'm gonna be a bit cautious about this. So, um, historically, I mean, it's not been unusual for leagues to have levies on teams which they and use uh, and use the money for developmental purposes. The the football league in England for uh, seventy odd years had a levy of four uh, percent, I think it was, on club revenues to fund the activities of the league as a whole. So it's possible to do that, but that's very distinct from my scheme and the reason why i want to keep it distinct is because i am appealing to the self-interest of the clubs insurance makes sense for the clubs themselves because it will make them more stable i'm not asking them to do something which is philanthropic to develop help somebody else i'm just asking them to help themselves and this, and this is a very simple scheme for helping themselves by paying into insurance fees. There's lots of good reasons why we want might to encourage them to do other things as well. But let's my my proposal is let's first put the clubs on a sound financial basis by providing by organizing insurance, which is in their interest, and then we can think about more um, more broader socially desirable goals. One goal, one objective. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Stefan. Um, so Steve, can you please share your presentation and you have 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will uh, share the presentation in a second. All right. That's great. Thank you Perfect. very much. Can you see, can you see yeah. everything? Yeah, it's all perfect. right. Thank you. Perfect. A good day to everyone. My, Steve is, my name is Steve Nutz and I'm a PhD researcher at the law faculty of the University of Antwerp. My research topic relates to optimizing football regulation and internal governance of football clubs from a legal perspective. First of all, I would like to um, thank uh, the organization for having us, in particular our colleagues Jean-Michel De Waal, Jean-François Cocard and Jeremy Bastien. This is a wonderful initiative that hopefully contributes to a positive change in the uh, football industry. Before starting off uh, with the presentation, I have to excuse my colleague uh, Robbie due to overlap with teaching activities. And I want to inform you that the views set out in this presentation are solely related to my own views. Then we will start off with the first slide. All right, so today's presentation We'll briefly discuss three topics that are related to my PhD research. One chapter discusses certain football regulation under EU law 
And this connection with EU law is therefore the common factor in the uh, three topics discussed today. First, I will start with the impact of EU law on a pre-authorization system used by sports governing bodies to increase their control on the regulation and organization of sporting events. The European Commission clarified certain aspects in this respect in the ISU case. An appeal was lodged before the General Court and exact today, the General Court released a press release confirming the Commission's decision for the greater part. Part of this decision could be useful in the current breakaway league discussions in the football industry. Second, we will revisit UEFA's homegrown player rule after a recent challenge under EU law of the homegrown player rule before the Belgian Court of Arbitration of Sports. That uh, Belgian Court of Arbitration of Sports has not found the homegrown player rule adopted by the Belgian FA to be in breach of EU law, but it shows that certain players in a specific period of their career could be restricted in their rights by this rule. A concept of talent pool drafting will be suggested. And then thirdly, considering the financial impacts of the global pandemic on the football industry, it might be useful to look for financing instruments outside the standard options available. In this respect, a regulated form of third-party investment could be an option. Third-party investment was banned by FIFA in 2015, and since then, various legal challenges were lodged against the legality of this ban under EU law. At this moment, no sporting or national court has found the ban to be in breach of EU law. Whilst these items all have the same starting point, being an analysis under EU law, considering the time restraints, the presentation will mainly focus on the outcome for the football industry instead of an extensive analysis of the legal aspects of these cases. Then the first discussion point, we will um, review the uh, impact of pre-authorization systems enforced by sports governing bodies for the organization of third party events in their sports sector and their related sanctioning mechanism, which both could have an impact on the future developments of a specific sport. In particular, the International Skating Union, ISU, introduced such pre-authorization system and also a severe sanctioning mechanism for athletes participating in non-authorized events. In fact, ISU must give prior consent to the organization of any third-party skating event and athletes participating in such events risk disciplinary measures ranging between a warning and a ban of multiple years. In its analysis of the case, the European Commission applied the same proportionality test as set out in the Mecca, Medina and Maiken case. Doing so, it verified whether ISU's control system and sanctioning mechanism could be upheld because it serves a legitimate aim and whether it is proportionate. The European Commission concluded that ISU infringed Article 101 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union by adopting and enforcing its pre-authorization system and sanctioning mechanism. ISU has lodged an appeal before the General Court and today the General Court released a press release confirming that uh, for the main part the Commission's decision um, is, is correct. Because of time restraints we will not go into too much detail on this case, but the important takeaway for the football industry is the analysis of certain legitimate aims by the European Commission uh, with regard to the, to the ISU case. Uh, this, of course, also relates to the discussion with regard to an establishment of a breakaway league in football, especially when taking into account that UEFA has a similar mechanism in its statutes. There are two broad legitimate aims reviewed in the ISU case that may qualify uh, as legitimate aims to uphold UEFA's pre-authorization mechanism. The first one is a solidarity model within the football pyramid. And the second one is the organization and proper conduct of competition. In addition, the European Commission set out that a pre-authorization system potentially could be upheld if it includes objective, non-discriminatory, transparent and proportionate criteria, as well as proportionate sanctions. It is questionable whether UEFA's current pre-authorization system would stand this test. On the other hand, if a group of elite clubs would like to establish a breakaway league separate from the football pyramid, they can do so without asking permission to UEFA and or FIFA. But there are two important caveats. The first one is that the new project needs to be compatible with EU law itself. 
And um, for, for example, a, a closed competition structure is likely to fail under the principles of EU law. And then secondly, the clubs and or players who participate in such breakaway league potentially risk sanctions from FIFA and UEFA. An example with regard to players um, is that they could be excluded from participating in matches of their national FA team. With respect to the, to the latter, to the sanctioning mechanism, the, deci the decision in the ESO case could provide important guidance. Uh, here it was concluded that certain sanctions for professional skaters who normally participated in unauthorized events were deemed disproportionately severe. Now, as already mentioned earlier today, the discussions on, on breakaway leaks is not something new. Among others, the Media Partners Project in 1998 try to set up a breakaway league. And in this specific case, the discussion, discussion among football stakeholders led to a stronger negotiation position of clubs when discussing the new Champions League format. In the long term, from my point of view, there are two potential outcomes for the football industry. The first one is a Super League separate from the current football pyramid. And a second one is a fully integrated pan-European league under the current football pyramid. The former project could have a detrimental effect on the current structure of football, in particular to its solidarity function, whilst the latter could serve as a solid basis to further harmonize football regulation on a pan-European level or even on a global level and try to optimize revenue distribution among football stakeholders. As uh, Sean already pointed out earlier today, cross-border initiatives, as for example, the Bene Liga, could potentially form the first steps in this direction this should definitely be further explored. So this first item related to the macro structure of the football industry, where it is important to know in which environment new regulations must be developed in the future. The following two topics are more specific and related to specific football uh, regulations that are uh, in force right now. Um, so the second slide or the second discussion point relates to a uh, talent pool drafting system and it emerged from the analysis of UEFA's homegrown player rule under EU law. Recently, a football player of 33 years old lodged a claim before the Belgian Court of Arbitration of Sports to challenge the homegrown player rule under, among others, uh, EU law principles. And the Court of Arbitration of Sports in Belgium concluded that the homegrown player rule adopted under the Belgian FA rules was compatible with EU law because it pursued, among others, the following two legitimate aims. The first one is to improve competitive balance, and the second one to encourage recruitment and training of young players, and that it also was proportioned to them. These aims were already set out and were used as building blocks for the analysis of the transfer system uh, under EU law in the Bosman case, of which we celebrated the 25th birthday this week. A first study in 2013, instructed by the European Commission, stated that it is unlikely that the homegrown player rule improves competitive balance. With regard to the second aim, it is not 100% clear that this specific rule has a positive impact on the development and training of young players. On the other hand, except to certain exceptional cases as recently lodged before the Belgian Court of Arbitration of Sports, it is less obvious whether the homegrown player rule has indeed restrictive effects. This example indicates that there are indeed players in very specific moments of their career that could potentially be harmed by this rule. Without entering into the discussion whether these exceptional limitations could be justified or not under the proportionality test, it is worthwhile to look into the initial purpose of UEFA for introducing this rule. And there were three uh, main purposes set out by UEFA. The first one is to reduce the stockpiling of the best players at the richest clubs. The second one is to give incentives to clubs to train uh, own players. And the third one is to re-establish a local identity of clubs. With regard to the first objective, to reduce stockpiling of players, it is more effective to include a cap on the maximum number of players that a club can sign. Alex already rightfully pointed this out this, earlier this morning. Um, regarding the two other objectives, I believe that a talent pool drafting system better meets these aims. It could replace or supplement the current homegrown player rule. Such system could be built upon the following four principles. First, the European continent could be divided into different regions 
in which, for example, small countries as Belgium and the Netherlands each constitute a separate region. If needed, bigger countries as France and Germany could be divided into different regions to satisfy the, the local identity needs. Secondly, each club has the opportunity to add a maximum number of own academy trained players younger than 23 years old to a, a local talent pool list. Uh, for example, three to eight players per season. And when a club decides to add a player to such list, to such list it is also important to allocate him to a, to a certain division in that country. For example, first division, second division, or third division, depending how, um, how organized the professional football league is in that country. And then also a timing aspect is quite important. Completion of the draft procedure should be finalized early pre-season to provide all teams, transferor teams and transferee teams with enough time to look for other opportunities in the transfer market prior to the start of the season. And then thirdly, standards drafting the rules should be set out. For example, the club with the lowest ranking at the end of the previous season may choose first from the talent pool allocated to its division. And then fourthly, lastly, the default rule regarding the salary costs of the player is that the former club and the new club share the salary costs equally and that such amount will be gradually reduced based upon fulfillment of certain milestones, ideally on the basis of playing minutes, and these reductions could then be paid from a youth player development fund. Different options are available here, but considering time restraints, I stick to the key principles. In summary, this concept constitutes a positive system which would reward clubs for producing more talents instead of the current more sanctioning rule, which limits a club in its ability to freely compose its team squad list. All parties uh, could benefit here from. Uh, first of all, the transferee club has access to uh, promising locally trained players from bigger clubs at a potential discount price. This could be very helpful for clubs who are just promoted and want to settle into the new competition without applying an excessive multiple on its annual salary budget. Uh, with regard to the transferor club, after the loan period, it has seen growth in experience and value of its player. And lastly, the player himself or herself has the opportunity to gain valuable experience at a professional level in the greater region of his or her training club. So that's the, the, the second discussion point. And then the final discussion point of today's presentation relates to a suggestion for a regulated framework for third party investment. Third party investment or defined as third party ownership by FIFA is a transaction whereby a third party provides funds to a football club in return for being entitled to a percentage of the proceeds of a football player's future transfer value. Different forms of TPI exist and two variations of these transactions are currently allowed. The first one is a, sell, a simple sell-on fee that a selling club negotiated with a buying club on the transfer of a player. In this case, the selling club will receive a percentage on the player's next transfer fee. Second, a player is allowed to obtain a percentage of his own academic, uh, economic rights as well. This could be used in contract negotiations between a player and a club when the latter wants to, wants to offer a competitive remuneration package without paying an excessive salary to the player. These forms are allowed by FIFA as these clubs and players are not regarded as third parties under the FIFA's regulation on status and transfer of players. Other transactions with third parties are prohibited on a global level by FIFA since 2015. Uh, the main concerns related to issues of conflict of interest and integrity of sporting competition. Not all football stakeholders supported this ban as it became a key aspect of the industry in certain regions of South America and South, uh, South Europe. Various legal challenges were lodged against the legality of FIFA's ban, but at this moment, no sporting or national court has found the ban to be in breach of EU law. An idea of a regulated TPI framework is not new. Prior to introducing a ban, football stakeholders have reviewed the option of regulated TPI. However, five years later and not yet experiencing the full economic consequences of a worldwide pandemic, it might be good it might be a good moment to, to revisit this discussion. A uh, regulated TPI framework should take into account the following three pillars, preserve integrity, avoid conflict of interest, 
and preserve financial sustainability of clubs. Many tools are available to preserve these values. I can list a few, but I will not go into detail considering time constraints. But for example, um, setting up a licensing system for uh, TPI investors, this could be built upon the same structure, which probably will be used by FIFA for reintroduction of regulation of the intermediaries. Uh, setting up an SPV to clearly separate the uh, decision-making rights and economic rights, and of course, limitations on the percentage of investment in a player, number of players per club and per competition, and so on. Um, I will conclude this part of the uh, presentation with uh, providing three key arguments to reintroduce a regula regulated TPI framework right now. Um, first, by imposing a global ban five years ago and taking into account that TPI transactions that were set up prior to that ban are now likely to be extinguished under the transitional regime, it is very likely that the football industry is now free of all official TPI transactions. This sets the perfect stage to establish a one-stop shop under the scrutiny of FIFA. This one-stop shop should focus on, among others, verification of the background of a potential TPI investor and provide full transparency to the market. Second, in the midst of a worldwide pandemic, which often leads to fierce discussions about finding aid measures from governmental bodies and allocation of funds within the football pyramid, it is necessary to look for other opportunities. A reintroduction of TPI might be low-hanging fruit for the football industry to partly overcome financial difficulties of the sector. And then third, lastly, this is a bit more a technical comment, but there are financing practices in the current football industry that may fall under the scope of FIFA's TPI ban when applying a very strict interpretation. One example is collateralization of an entire squad's transfer value in the context of a financing um, arrangement. Certain domestic rules of football associations and leagues rightfully allow these specific exceptions to TPI, whilst FIFA does not elaborate on this. A clarification from FIFA should be welcomed, and doing so, it might consider certain aspects of today's suggestions. Thank you for your attention, and let me know should you have any questions. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, I'm really happy to, to talk about TPO, as you said, five or six years later than, than when yeah. it was a very hot topic. So um, uh, very interesting topic, very interesting ideas. Hopefully they're going to be subject to, to, to questions and debate after the, the presentations that are going to follow. Thank you, Steve. So the, the next presentation uh, comes from uh, Germany again. Um, um, Michael Drewes and uh, Luca Rebergiani. Um, I met Luca in, in China a couple of years ago. Uh, hi, Luca. Very hi. happy to, to have you here. Um, so, guys, can you please share your, your screen? And you have 20 minutes. Thank you. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Do you hear me? Perfectly. So, and you see this, the screen, you see the presentation. Okay. Yeah, um, my name is Luca Rebegiani. I'm a professor of economics at FOM University. This is a private uh, vocational university in Germany. And this is a joint research with my colleague Michael Dreves from Mannheim, from FOM of Mannheim. And so um, this is a very short version of our research of the last years. And I will even be shorter because many topics uh, have already been addressed today. Uh, so I will uh, only very briefly repeat the main problems. And then we want now to suggest one or two solutions and not really to suggest, but to discuss them. So um, we start talking about the competitive balance and we see it's decreasing and we regard it as a problem. And um, we want to search for a practicable solution uh, to um, find another way. And the solution which would be compatible with, with the tradition of European football. And um, so we have heard a lot uh, about the competitive balance and uh, many empirical figures. Um, so 
I will be very short. And um, we have a situation during the last decade where we have had uh, only few clubs dominating national and international competitions. And uh, um, a situation was uh, so that really you didn't have a very high uncertainty of outcome. There was more or less clear who would win the championship. And um, this was the case in the big five leagues and also in Europe. And we regard it as a problem from the viewpoint of sports economics. And uh, we see that there are very weak distribution mechanism in Europe and we have uh, really uh, widening financial gaps in leagues and between leagues. And so there were um, since decades plans for the start in European Super Leagues and even the, the actual uh, format of the Champions League is a sort of reaction in order to keep the clubs in Europe in the traditional UEFA competition. And um, the problem that we see is that uh, clubs um, generate very high revenues in European competitions, and then they, they have much higher financial possibilities and they use this revenues to dominate their national competitions. So um, what we think that one should address this specific problem and, and search for a solution that um, could be to try to strengthen national leagues and especially the leagues um, of um, a smaller a countries in order to make the clubs more competitive. This would be solution number one. Or um, one could argue that you need a sort of uh, um, broader solution. You need a sort of European Super League, which would be to yeah, um, possibly to, to loosen this uh, double participation in national and international competition. Obviously, uh, one could think of um, yeah, uh, spending more money to balance the, this and yeah, to contrast this widening gap. But this is in Europe rather difficult. Um, and we think that uh, this situation was even worsened by COVID-19 because this hits uh, severely the smaller clubs, uh, especially clubs which, are, uh, which rely heavily on uh, gate revenues. And this is the case, for example, in uh, Germany, where you can attract uh, and, and you can see that the smaller clubs are very much, uh, very uh, high dependent on uh, gate revenues, which are now as a, almost completely gone. And you have an even uh, worse situation in other sports, for example, ice hockey or handball, which are very popular in Germany, but where clubs um, heavily rely on uh, gate revenues. So, um, and we observe first sign of a, decline in a fan attendance, as even in media, so that we see that this um, lack of uncertainty of outcome starts to become a problem, even for um, spectators and a television. Uh, so one possible solution would be the establishment of supranational leagues. And we have tackled the example of Belgium and the Netherlands, and we have many Dutch people here, Belgian people. And this is a striking case because um, Dutch teams and Belgian teams were once uh, powerful teams. And uh, you had Ajax, you have PSV Eindhoven, but you have even teams like Mechelen, which were able to win European uh, competition. And this would be in, impossible today. And so I would like to link to what Markus Kursch had said that um, before, that it, it's a problem for us because it should be possible that uh, big traditional clubs should be able to tackle this uh, very rich and powerful English uh, clubs. And um, so th this is what we mean by uncertainty of outcome. And um, what happened? It happened that you have very small markets in, in the Netherlands and in Belgium. So you, you really observe a financial declines of the national leagues. And 
as, as you can see here, the uh, national leagues of Belgium and the Netherlands are even... Luca, yeah. Luca, just, just um, your slides are not, I mean, in the PowerPoint, you're not using your PowerPoint. We cannot, we cannot follow no. you. Okay. I don't know why. I thought so. I thought at first that you that you were already improvising because uh, you said that most of the no. things were already tackled. Okay, <laughs> that sounds better. Yeah, <laughs> please oh, put I'm... it on in full screen, and that's going to be easier for everyone. Okay. Do you uh, do you see them now? Yeah. Now it's better so, because we we could see the first slide, but then it it didn't uh, follow your presentation. So and put it in 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 the big screen in the full screen, please. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Luca. Sorry. No, no, it's, it's... Uh, uh, do we see it now? It's not in the full screen, but uh, so yet, but maybe it will. Okay, but just... Yeah, we can see the slide, but not in, it's not in full screen. <laughs> uh, just a minute, for just a minute. Um, let me... So now? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, sorry, sorry. I'm Start again. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> okay. As always, I was talking about the fate of the minor leagues, for example, Belgium and the Netherlands. And um, so we had once a very powerful football nations. And um, yeah, uh, now it's more or less impossible that the Belgian team could win the Champions League. And what happened? It happened that we have, we have very small markets in Belgium and the Netherlands, and we observe a financial decline. So you see that even the second German uh, league is, uh, has, has a, a higher revenue than the uh, first Dutch league, and they are far away to compete with the first German league or the Premier League. Uh, so you have huge difference, and this difference widen every year. And even if if you look at uh, um, turnover of the single clubs, you see here that um, even uh, very traditional, powerful Dutch clubs are uh, far away from a top European clubs. And this um, is um, yeah. Are reflected even by the wage um, expenses, which are far higher for Premier League clubs or for um, yeah, uh, clubs of, of the European top leagues. So um, we observe that Dutch and Belgium teams are not competitive anymore, and we link it to uh, this uh, yeah financial shortfall of these leagues, and. Um, we say that one possible solution would be to create a larger market. And um, this, yeah, and the Netherlands and, and Belgium would be a, a very good example because they are more or less linked together culturally. So um, we would like to discuss the establishment of a super national league of the Benelux League, um, where we have had already a few examples in in other sports. So for example, ice hockey, for example, handball. And um, the, the target would be to create a larger market and to uh, generate um, more revenues. For example, broadcasting rights, for example, sponsoring, um, not so much for ticketing revenues. Um, it's not very easy to estimate um, how much revenues would grow, but we think that you would have a, a turnover growth by a factor of more or less one and a half. And we think that this would be a way to enable this um, clubs to be more competitive and to have larger markets and to be more competitive. Um, we also spend time for thinking about opportunities and risks. We think that this uh, plan would be feasible you would have um, as a homogeneous participants and you would have a few existing examples and politics would be more or less in the favor. We do not know what would happen culturally, for example, with the Wallonie, if they would like to play uh, against uh, Ajax and Eindhoven, and we do, do not know um, what would be the reaction from UEFA and FIFA. And this would be a matter of further research. 
And I give now the floor to my colleague, Michael. Yes, hello. I have to go to the arena, so I will do so. And uh, hopefully you see yeah, that's the slides now. Yeah. Michael, perfect. And you hear me too, okay. Good. So I'm talking about the European Super League, which has been mentioned a couple of times uh, today. And most of the commentators seem to see it as a threat for um, European uh, football. And we would like to discuss if uh, the European Super League can be a solution or maybe an opportunity for the smaller clubs, for the fans. Um, Indeed, it would not uh, comply with the uh, European tradition of uh, uh, football. But we wanted to discuss this. So the European Super League would be a breakaway league. And the goals of this breakaway league would be to maximize profits, higher competitive balance, and of course, also to reduce uh, the sporting risk. But there are also some challenges connected to the European Super League. Economic rationality is only given if um, if the additional income from that European Super League is higher than the income you would probably lose um, if you go into European Super Leagues. Then there are some some questions: which clubs will be, take part? Governance questions: uh, what what is the role of the national competitions? And you don't have, for example, uh, derbies here in the European Super League. The economic rationality, that's what the literature says, is only given for participants from minor national leagues, for example, from Scandinavia or from the Benelux region. Um, but exactly these clubs would probably not take part in the European Super League. For teams from major national leagues, the answer is hard, uh, hard to, uh, the question is hard to answer because it's uh, dependent on, on several um, um, aspects. So for example, what is the role of the national leagues? How important are the local derbies? And uh, which distribution mechanisms will be connected to the European Super League? Nevertheless, there are always rumors or, or once in a while rumors about plans to start a European Super or Premier League. There, was, uh, there were rumors in 2018. And only recently, there were rumors that came from some English clubs. Uh, that was mentioned earlier this morning. So we try to consider three different scenarios that we consider um, probable for European Super League. And um, I make this fast because I come to this um, afterwards again. And we want to uh, find out if these um, scenarios are practical or viable. So the first scenario is kind of the current situation with an European Super League. So um, the UEFA Champions League would become more or less the European Super League um, with uh, certain clubs that always take part in uh, the European Super League. And um, otherwise there wouldn't be much uh, change. Um, we still have the hierarchy, the pyramid uh, in European football. Um, and if you consider that from the perspective of sports economics, the uncertainty of outcome problem um, will remain and will probably become even bigger if teams compete in an international and national level um, because they have a double income. And um, the, the top clubs still have a um, potential to threaten the other clubs, to, uh, to threaten the associations to leave um, the, the association and uh, go for an own league. Um, from an antitrust level, this um, allows still market entry through the relegation system. So this is good from the entry trust perspective. And um, we think this will only be a short-term uh, solution because it's um, the, the uncertainty of outcome will be diminished. The second scenario is the US sports scenario. And this is probably the scenario that I consider kind of the solution for the problem or that could be a solution. 
I didn't like it at first. You know? I'm, I'm not really a fan of the US sports um, league, but as far as we have gone now in European football and the problems we are facing in European football, this might be a chance, I think. I, I come more and more to that, um, uh, to that idea. Um, so there, there won't be any uh, top games on the national level. Um, teams would uh, take part either in the European Super League, in the standalone league, or in the national leagues, um, which would mean for the top clubs that they would lose sources of income. And, uh, but it is uh, what we would have uncertainty of outcome in the European Super League and in the national uh, leagues, it would probably improve too. Um, from the antitrust perspective, there are a couple of issues. Um, there's no relegation. Um, the market entry is foreclosed, more or less. Um, the European authorities will probably not like that. Um, but there are some clubs from Middle and Eastern Europe and some stronger drawing clubs that would not take part in the European Super League. And this would probably attract rival leagues. And uh, this can be considered as a kind of mono monopolistic competition. And this raises the opportunity for the other clubs to set up new forms, to be disruptive, to be creative, and see if the market is contestable. So we still don't think this is uh, very likely, but maybe it's an opportunity for the other clubs to set up a rival league and say to the big clubs, go make your own league, earn money, we have our own league and we will have fun there. Second scenario, that's the scenario that um, probably uh, emerged from the 2018 proposal, the partly open ESL with um, connection to the currently existing leagues and um, that would probably only worsen all, all of the problems. Um, as well as, as from the sports economics perspective and from the antitrust perspective. So this will probably not come into, uh, into being. So to conclude it and to open the discussion, now we, we European football is in a dilemma. That is the, like the theme of the whole day. And um, one solution could be that we have, um, um, super, uh, supernatural leagues, oh, sorry, supernatural leagues um, that kind of uh, increase their financial possibilities and then they have a sandwich position between the top international competitions and the national leagues. Uh, so that could be a, a, a part of the solution. Nevertheless, it is questionable. It's, if this is enough to address the competitive problems European football is facing. And therefore we need a new, um, new uh, organization of the European uh, football and the Hermetic League um, could in our, uh, in our view be an opportunity to, to diversify European football, not to um, monopolize it. Okay, so I was fast. I was getting fast at the end, but I always made made it in time. Thanks you yeah, for your fast attention. Is than, fast is better than slow, and we were <laughs> really uh, sure that the Germans could be on time. So that that's perfect, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. And now it's, uh, Italian, uh, Luca, you live. Um, you've been. You, you've lived in Germany long enough now. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, uh, guys. The, I'm sure there's going to be questions, and if there's not from others, there's going to be from me. <laughs> so thank you very much. We, we have the last presentation from uh, Chale Vanenburg. Uh, hi, Chale, and um, I don't know how you pronounce your first name, to be honest. Um, looking forward to your presentation. Unmute. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Okay, uh, thank you for the opportunity to give the presentation and, and also thank you for this uh, very nice uh, conference. I think everyone will agree with that. Um, I will talk about also about European competition law like the two people, three people before me and football. And I will also focus on national markets. Um, this was an idea 
I got some two years ago. It's a combination of an economic analysis and a legal perspective. And originally I thought this idea is so simple that it cannot be good. If it's good, somebody else should have invented it long ago. And so I went on to study the literature and I did not find the idea really, so I went on. And uh, the article is now forthcoming in Managing Sport and Leisure, but I'm still in doubt. So uh, this could be interesting. Uh, wait a moment. Yeah, here's first the main conclusion. I think that the European law implies that the European Commission or the European Court should forbid first all threats of big clubs to start a Super League and secondly also the actu actual creation of a Super League. Uh, some legal schoolers have gone in the same way to some extent but I think I can add to their arguments with uh, my new perspective, at least that's what I hope. This is the structure of my presentation. First, we will do some groundwork. I will talk about economic competition, the Super League, and the relation between UEFA and the big clubs. And after that, uh, we will be going towards conclusion with the core of the presentation being the legal analysis and some conclusions which follow directly from that. Uh, but first, some words on economic competition. Uh, let me define a top club as a club that has a realistic chance in the eyes of the fans, because that is what counts, of winning important prizes within 10 years. And I think that in most countries, we have discussed this today, and uh, the number of top clubs has decreased since 1960. So we can say that long-term competitive balance has decreased. This morning we had, uh, I think it was Fabio telling us about it, and he called it uh, competitive uh, intensity. But basically, I think everyone agrees here. But the question here is not what does this mean to the satisfaction of the fans? Do the fans like uncertainty of outcome, for instance? We have discussed that today. The question is, what will it mean for the prices which fans are paying? And I think we all agree that all fans like low prices. We could agree, disagree about how much they love uncertainty of outcome, they all like uh, low prices. So let's continue uh, and looking at economic competition. First of all, I think it's the fact that most consumers like to watch one or more clubs from their own country. When Dutch people are looking at club football, they are looking at matches with at least one Dutch club in the majority of the cases. If all Dutch clubs taken together would simultaneously increase their prices, say the prices of TV pictures, to a large extent, this would cause very few Dutch fans to, to become a fan of an English club. Even if the prices of Ajax rise, that will not be a reason for, an, for many Ajax fans to become a fan of Arsenal. And this means by definition that, that at least some or some important relevant markets for the products of the football sector are national markets. There are, I agree that there are also international markets. Uh, Dutch people can choose between uh, Barcelona, Real or Chelsea, Arsenal, for instance. But at least some of the important relevant markets are national markets. This is where many clubs compete with one another. Uh, another thing is if a consumer likes to watch matches of a specific club, he will often choose a top club. Many Dutch people are a fan of one of the three big clubs, exactly because they can win important prizes, because they are a top club. And of course, they would like their top club to be located nearby, so fans from Amsterdam will choose Ajax, fans from Rotterdam, Feyenoord, but they want a top club, at least many fans. And now we see, as many people have discussed today, the number of top clubs has decreased. And this, and this is the core of this presentation, this means less competition on the national markets. So I put it in bold, the lower long-term competitive balance automatically means less economic competition. And let me give uh, just an example uh, from a boy from Amsterdam. Suppose he wants to become fan of a top club who can become Dutch champions at least. 
Uh, there are three or five clubs like that now in the Netherlands, but there were about 10 in 1960. And suppose he's living in Amsterdam, but he wants a club within 20 kilometers of his home. In 1960, he had at least two choices. Ajax, Amsterdam, they were the Dutch champions in 1960, but also Davy is Amsterdam, the people's club, playing in a much bigger stadium, be, becoming the Dutch champions in 1964. That was a very reasonable choice. So the boy had two chances, uh, two options. And I suppose Ajax increased its prices, which it might have done because it has a small stadium. That could turn the boy to DBS, or it could induce his father to take the boy to DBS, hoping he would become a fan of DBS. So there was competition then. If at present a boy from Amsterdam wants a top club within 20 kilometers, he has one choice only, Ajax. And then if Ajax increases its prices, the boy will still choose Ajax. Feyenoord is 80 kilometers away, PSV Eindhoven is much further away. So there is less competition now. And to finish the economic uh, part, less economic competition, we all know it means higher prices and so lower consumption and welfare. Basically, this is the main reason why we have European competition law. The reason of European competition law is not to have more competition, it's ha to have lower prices, a larger product variety, and high quality products, of course. That's why we want economic competition and also for innovation, but that's not very important today. So this is also in the spirit of European competition law. Now the European Super League, uh, that could be, I'm talking today of what Michael had called a standalone league. Uh, clubs no longer play in the national leagues. This could be a, a competition of 20 or 60 clubs. Uh, I think that the present system is more attractive in principle. And uh, some of the people talking today uh, agreed with that, unless competitive balance is getting too low in the present system. And maybe it's not too low yet, but we may reach a tipping point where it is really becoming too low. And here we come to the, the big advantage of the Super League also mentioned today. In a Super League, competitive balance will certainly be higher. Uh, some speakers this morning have said it, Stefan Simonski has said it. That is sure, that's the advantage. So here we can conclude, we come back to it later. In principle, the present league system is most attractive for the fans, but only if UEFA or the government succeeds in restoring competitive balance, having some measures for it. So the question is, will UEFA do it? Well, the good thing of UEFA is that it's a democratic union. This means that associations from small countries, which favor the small European clubs, they have the majority of the votes. And this could lead to measures that improve competitive balance in principle. That's the democratic principle. And the present chairman, who's from a small country too, he also wants more competitive balance and he has proposed a number of measures for it. Uh, we could talk long about the measures, but I am sure, and I have published about it with Anna Springs in Scottish Journal of Competitive, uh, Scottish Journal of Political Economy. I am sure there are measures like a progressive taxation for all clubs, which can restore competitive balance to any extent we desire be it a little or be it much. So there are measures, Severin is taking a different view, but he's also confident some measures will help. And uh, let's not discuss that issue any further because I want to focus on the legal things. The problem is for UEFA, although it's a democratic union, decision-making is determined at present to a large extent by the big clubs. These clubs have taken joint actions and I put it in bold because of its legal significance. They have taken joint actions such as threatening to start a Super League. As we saw today, this began in 1998 when some big clubs and Berlusconi and Murdoch came together to start a Super League. That was a joint action and they threatened or wanted to start a Super League. 
And as a result of that, uh, UEFA has taken measures that strengthen the big clubs instead of improving competitive balance, which it probably wants to do, but which it does not do because of the threats of the big clubs. And this picture has repeated itself since 1998, at least one or two times. Uh, many uh, discussions are, are secret, I guess, but this is the picture. So what can we say? These joint actions have reduced competitive balance. And as discussed before, that automatically means they have reduced economic competition. So we're talking here about joint actions that have reduced, you could also say restricted, economic competition. And joint actions could also be called agreements or concerted practices, to, to use some legal terms. And so now we come to the legal analysis. And I, unlike uh, some other legal schoolers, I am not focusing on Article 102, which is also very interesting. I am focusing on Article 101 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, which prohibits all agreements between undertakings and all concerted practices, which have as their effect the prevention, restriction, or distortion of competition. So the joint actions they have distorted or restricted competition. And so they are incompatible with Article 101, which is why the European Commission should prohibit the joint actions of the big club. There is no other way, in my view, in my simple economic view, I like to add, and I like the comments of, of legal schools especially. If it is prohibited, decision-making within UEFA will be based on democratic principles again. We get more competitive balance and the present league system will then be more attractive than any super league alternative. Um, some legal scholars got a more or less similar conclusion, but they based themselves on Article 102, which is also very relevant. So I think I just added to that. But Pietlovic makes an important remark. She says, well, suppose we apply the law, then the threats of the big clubs will be forbidden and the UEFA will make the big clubs weaker because it wants to make the small clubs stronger, weaker on the field at least. So the big clubs may not like it. And because of that, they may actually start a Super League. And this could be even worse. Maybe this is her suggestion, maybe not, but it's my suggestion at least. So the big question now is the Super League itself compatible with the treaty. And here I, I'm having a different perspective from uh, the previous speakers. First of all, I think this is also what Steve said, but um, something like that was also said by Parrish and Mitinen and Piet Luic, a closed Super League is incompatible with the treaty. And I agree with that. But and this is my last big sheet before the conclusions. Uh, in my view, any Super League, whether it's a closed or an open one, obstructs Article 101. For that, I think I need three legal arguments, one, three, and four. But I like to include, include number two, two, because somehow it, it makes the story complete in my view. First of all, the Super League is based on an agreement between big clubs. Uh, without agreement, there will be no Super League. So because of that, Article 101 could be relevant in principle. Now, the second point, and I do not know whether it's necessary from a legal perspective, but I think the European Union can be expected to apply the law because it has to apply the law. So it will forbid the threats of a Super League. This will then enable UEFA to restore competitive balance, and this will mean that the present system is attractive again. And this is all what the European Union wants. Product variety, the present system is having it. Low prices, we come to that in a second, but the present system is better in that than the Super League. And products of a high quality, at least some speakers have said that the present system is, is offering high quality in terms of more satisfaction for the fans. Now I come to point three, and that's the major thing. I think a Super League by nature strengthens the regular participants in the Super League relative to the non-participants. 
So it leads to an increase in the market power of the participants. And let me explain that a little bit longer. Um, for instance, in a Super League, there will be a number of countries who have one club in the Super League only. Uh, take, for instance, the proposal of Tsimanski and Heun of 1999. Tsimanski mentioned it already. He had a very nice proposal, much better than the American League system, I guess, with 60 instead of 30 clubs and, and then four divisions and so on. It's, it was a very nice proposal if you like a Super League, if that is where we go. From these 16, there were 18 countries who had only one club in the Super League. There could also be, and I want to go to an, a Dutch example, so that is why I focus on a Super League of 24 clubs. There could also be a Super League of 24 clubs. This may be more likely because that is interesting for the big clubs. And in such a club a system, there would even be only one participant from the Netherlands. And as a Feyenoord fan, I'm very sorry to say that this club would not be Feyenoord Rotterdam, it would not be PSV Eindhoven, it would be Ajax. And what would this mean for the market power of our Ajax? This is now the question in this example. Well, first of all, suppose we have a closed league. Then it's simple. Ajax will, in the relevant market of the Netherlands, have a monopoly on top football. It will be the only club which can win an important prize in the future. We are having the American system of a hermetic closed league. Only Ajax uh, can win the European soccer club. So consider a boy in the north of the Netherlands, Groningen, which uh, wants to become six years old. He becomes a football fan. He's not certain which club will become his favorite club, but he wants a club which wins important prizes or can do it in the future. He has one option only, Ajax. There is no competition left. If Ajax increases its prices, the boy, if he really wants a top club, he still has to choose Ajax. So this means in a close league, Ajax will nearly have a monopoly which is quite comparable to the monopoly of the Dutch national team during the World Championships. All Dutch people are watching the Dutch national team. If the price of watching it would be 30 euros, few Dutch people would become fan of the French national team. I'm sorry to say, but we stick to the Netherlands, whatever the price. So the Dutch national team is having a monopoly. Ajax will get the same monopoly in a closed Super League. And this is based on Article 101, which means it's not good. But let's go to an open Super League then. What does this mean? Ajax will be a club playing regularly in the open Super League. It already starts to have more fans in the Netherlands than PSV and Feyenoord, even more than Feyenoord, which is a big club traditionally. It's the people's club. Um, so we have an open league. Ajax will play regularly there. I think that PSV and Feyenoord, because of their lower financial capabilities, will at best play there now and then. They may gain promotion to the Super League from a lower division, but once they are there, they will be relegated again very soon probably. So because Ajax is playing regularly in that Super League, it will have throughout the years much higher revenues than Feyenoord and PSV, a much better youth development plan, and so a much better team overall. In most matches, it will win from Feyenoord and PSV. So the boy from the north of the Netherlands, who really wants a top club, a real top club, will still choose Ajax. And Ajax may not have a monopoly in that situation, but it will have a lot of market power, which is also called monopoly power by economists. So this means that the prices will be high. And indeed, uh, this is just an example of a monopoly. In England, there will be only four clubs, but uh, their market perhaps, but their market power will increase compared to the present situation too, because- new one, mi one minute, please. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you, sorry. So, the business model of a Champions League is to increase the market power of its participants. That's why, even though it is not nicer for the fans, even though it's not generating more welfare, it will arise because it is creating market power for the participants. 
That is going against the treaty. And so it's clear the European Union should forbid all threats to start a Super League and the actual creation of a Super League so that my club Feyenoord, which is playing in the most beautiful stadium of the Netherlands, where the Dutch team is winning mo much more often than in the Ajax stadium, that club should remain an important club not only because uncertainty of outcome is relevant or competitive balance, but because the European Union wants economic competition and low prices. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jean Francois. The microphone. Jean Francois. Microphone. Microphone. Yes, thank you, Sally. Um, I, I saw that uh, Miss uh, Pietlovich was was mentioned in your article. I know she's here. Maybe she wants to to react. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> there, there was a uh, an question yes. of Miss uh, Pietlovich. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you for organizing an interesting seminar. First of all. Um, about the very last presentation, um, I would like to say just that, yes, uh, I, I think if you have read my book, I have uh, conducted a, a thorough analysis of the uh, position that uh, um, the big clubs are, in fact, um, um, uh, abusing their uh, collective dominant position. And that was under Article 102 of the treaty. And you have analyzed it from the point of view of Article 101, uh, which really doesn't, I think, make any difference because um, as long as the clubs can justify that, uh, that the justification is really the same under both articles, more or less. The economic efficiencies are economic efficiencies, and if there is a public uh, interest justification, that will be the same. So the um, main question here is uh, whether or not the threats to break away uh, are uh, problematic from the point of view of competition law. And yes, I think they are because the um, uh, real objective of those threats is to uh, force the governing body to uh, adjust the rules to their advantage, to perhaps uh, give them a leverage in uh, governance and so they can infiltrate via the uh, ECA, so the European Club Association, um, the various boards in UEFA uh, and of course the representation of the clubs is very welcome and uh, the centralized uh, decision making system is extremely positive development but this particular de decentralized system in which the clubs are represented by the elite clubs is really not good for European football and competitive balance at all. So uh, in that sense, uh, the threats to break away in order to accomplish some of those governance or uh, other goals um, is perhaps uh, 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 an abuse of a collective dominant position by these clubs. Um, it can also mean, and you're quite right, under Article 101 that this is a, an agreement. And in fact, um, Articles 101 and 102 can be applied simultaneously. So, um, you know, um, it's, uh, it's pretty much uh, the, the same, um, the, the two sides of the same coin and the justification then for this kind of abuse or for this kind of uh, restriction on competition would be um, the same under both articles, um, technically. And yeah, I, I really like, um, I really like the, the, the conclusion and uh, all of that really uh, chimes with what I've been writing before so yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for, for uh, that was more a comment than, than a question. I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, I've, I've written a lot about this. So I had to say something. No, thanks for the comments and thanks for your book because I learned a lot from it. <laughs> oh, thank you, thanks. Good to hear always, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're, we're talking about clubs. Um, we have the chance to have somebody who's working on a club, Dennis. Good as it. Uh, could you please take the floor and please introduce yourself and uh, to tell us about what you think about ECA, about the representation of clubs at the European level? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, on the back of uh, what Kat Katalina was just <clears throat> saying, firstly, just to say a couple of words, I come from a small club in Croatia, Lokomotiva Zagreb, and thanks for the opportunity to say a few words. I don't know how much time I have, but uh, I, 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 real, I feel very passionate about uh, 
the subject of small club representation. So I have quite a bit to say, but you can cut, cut me off if I'm if I'm talking too long. But uh, um, you know, I, I think it's to begin. I think it'd be good to say and to begin by saying that UEFA has a difficult job, and uh, it's not easy. Uh, you know, under all this pressure that's coming that's coming towards UEFA. Uh, primarily brought about by the huge influx of money that's coming into 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 football and club football, and uh, so so it's not difficult. It's very difficult for them to balance and and uh, to to adhere to the the values that they deem to protect. Uh, you know, we have to understand that, uh, and uh, I think it's very important. Uh, it came up in uh, Katarina's uh, comments. It's very important that, that uh, we, we we confirm that UEFA has statutory and regulatory obligations which they have to adhere to so it's not something that is negotiable uefa has to uh, you know uh, protect social and community values um, to implement a fair system of solidarity to to implement a system of accessibility to competitions to adhere to the, the you know european model of sport and promotion and relegation and, and to organize uh, uh, you know, competitions based on these principles. So in, in the perspective of, say, for example, a small club, because I, many presentations today, they didn't mention smaller clubs. You know, we're talking about super leagues, we're talking about big clubs, we're talking about commercialization, uh, you know, even more money for the big clubs, but not so much what happens to the small clubs in the meantime. So, you know, uh, I, I think that for us, you know, we're a small club and participating in the Champions League is a dream that will probably never happen. But, uh, you know, we admire this competition. Um, it's the best club competition in the world. We watch in admiration, fantastic players, fantastic clubs. And, but we also emphasize that this competition also belongs to us. You know, it, it's not a competition that belongs to only super, super powerful clubs. It, it, you know, we, we know that it's not interesting for Barcelona or Real Madrid to play Lokomotiva in a European match. This is understandable. But the, the fact that we have this dream and, and, and it's possible for us to play against Real Madrid, this is what makes UEFA competitions so unique. And, and let's let's not forget, there are you know, 900 or 1,000 clubs who are dreaming this dream. And, and the fact that we're able to keep this dream together, it adds... You know, it adds a lot of legitimacy and and, and value to, to to smaller clubs. You know, uh, Katarina touched on an, an important point, and I think it's 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 very important. Smaller clubs are lacking in in representation. You know, uh, our club had six players in the final six players that played with our club in the final of the World Cup, yet nobody knows about Lokomotiva Zagreb. So so we're we we're, we're, we're quite aware of our place in the hierarchy. And, uh, but we also feel that we should have a, you know, a position in the decision-making process because we also have a role to play. And it, it might be a humble role, role, but it's also a very important uh, role. And I think that ECA, due to the very complicated membership criteria, and, and let's be honest, I think it, it's safe to say that primarily they're representing the top 20 clubs, which is also okay. You know, these top clubs, they uh, operate in a, uh, you know, in, in a, you know, different environment, and, and and of course they need the representation. But more importantly, smaller clubs have been, to be honest, I think in my opinion, ex excluded from, um, you know, the, the, the decision making process, and uh, and this needs to change because otherwise, if we lose smaller and medium sized clubs, then the the pyramid system in in European football will, you know, will collapse. So basically, I think we need to uh, return to a unified club football landscape. We need to uh, we need to have more dialogue. We need to have more involvement of different stakeholders, and and not only address issues that are related uh, relate to you know the big commercial interests of, of of big clubs. And I think the coming period will emphasise this even more because we're all working in a really yeah strange situation with with COVID and. Uh, so this reiterates the importance for us to, to, to be included in all the decisions which are being made by governing bodies. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, Michael, you wanted to answer that maybe? And answer or react? Huh?
so there have been a, a lot of um, uh, comments on, on my proposal. And uh, th there was one from Katarina Pekovic. Uh, she said Hermetic League reach EU laws and um, Tele Thunderburg said that too. And uh, dominance of big leagues, blackmail potential for the big, big clubs. I agree with all of that. Yeah? So no disagreement there. But what I think, I, I don't see another solution. So that's exactly why the small cl clubs should say, we don't want to have the big clubs anymore. So the big, the small clubs should send the big clubs to the European Super Leagues, and they can have their fun in, in the national leagues. And uh, Remy Venal asked, what, what is the stake for, uh, for the clubs to play in a, in a like, uh, national league that has um, less importance? So my, my, the, the, the question I ask, um, what is, the, what is the stake for the clubs that are now in the national leagues and don't have a chance to win a, the title or, or, or qualify for the European Cups? Um, so the question is unanswered in, in any way. And um, so um, they may ask also, um, what if the prestige matches are trivialized in the Super League? That's the problem with the Super League. Yeah. So I, I rely on the market forces there. If they are boring, they are boring and nobody will watch them. <laughs> And that's fine with me. I watch the national game. <laughs> Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, Ste Stefan Szymanski, you, you had comments as well? Sorry, yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, well, so, I mean, on the, on the competition law issue, I think, I think one has to be very careful here. Um, higher prices are not against competition law in Europe or anywhere else there. Um, if, if the, the point about a Super League is that it would uh, claim to offer um, better quality products. And I, I just quickly looked in the last five years, Liverpool, which is obviously one of the biggest clubs in Europe, historically has played the big three of Barcelona, Bayern Munich and Real Madrid five times in five years. If they were in a Super League, they'd probably play twice each team twice a year um, so that would mean 30 games against the biggest clubs rather than five and that would be considered a huge expansion of output that would probably sell in the market in the broadcast markets for 100 million euros or more and that is easy to justify on competition law grounds as it is just as easy to justify on economic grounds. And this is the thing people have to face up to with the Super League. There is a real problem that the big clubs don't play each other often enough, given the level of interest that there is in their game. And any solution to this has to really figure out how to, how to meet that, that problem. Um, the solution that I wrote about 20 years ago with Tom Hohen, that's one was one attempt to try and find a way around this. I don't think it's easy. I think it's, it's going to be a problem, but I think that's the consideration that people have to bear in mind when we talk about a Super League. Thank you, Stefan. Um, we, we have somebody that I don't know, Phil Draper. You, you said you, 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 you said it seems that you're working in a federation, the Welsh Federation. I'm sure you have comments and reactions to what you, you've been listening to today, uh, especially maybe the the pan-European leagues, would, you, would, would the Welsh Federation like to develop a, um, a competition with the Irish, Scottish, I don't know? You tell me what, what you think about Super Leagues. What is your opinion about the, the fact that the, the biggest Welsh clubs participate to the Premier League? Is it good? Is it bad? We know Scottish, cl Scottish clubs don't. Um, can you react maybe? So with regards to the um, Welsh clubs that, that we deal with, um, unfortunately, at the moment, the, the importance is bettering the standard of domestic football in our country. I don't think we're at a stage where we can even consider um, going into any Super Leagues as such. Um, with regards to the exile clubs, so Cardiff City, Swansea, uh, Wrexham, Newport, um, as you know, they've decided to be in the English system. And at this stage, we don't see those clubs coming back. I know we had one club back last year, Colwyn Bay. Um, but again, we aren't at the standard domestically to, to be able to consider um, the merging of such leagues. With regards to 
um, competitive balance, I think it's important to really define what you mean by competitive balance. So my issue with the, with the phrase competitive balance is, is that it shouldn't be taking from the bigger clubs or trying to constrain them as such to give to other clubs. It should be giving other clubs a foot up to be able to close that gap, to ensure they have a voice at the table, um, at the top table, so that the rules and the, and the regulations that are adapted or advanced don't constrain them any further. And I think it's important that we define competitive balance as closing that gap rather than trying to limit or prohibit the top clubs to take away from them to then give back to the lower clubs. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Phil. It was much appreciated. Um, back to the first presentation from Steve. Uh, Didier, I think I, I'm, I'm sure you have you want to react on the TPO, TPI, because we've been working together on this topic for a long time. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jean-Francois, and thank you for the, the, the three different presentations of this afternoon. It was really very, very interesting. Uh, I tried to make the link between the different uh, uh, topics. Uh, uh, my question is, do, don't you think, and maybe for, for Steve, uh, first of all, don't, do you think that uh, this, uh, uh, the, the new place of, of this new investor towards uh, TPI, um, is currently uh, modifying the, the, the balance of power inside, inside the European system, uh, the governance of the, of the European system. And, and this is a link with the last part of the discussion. And the, 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 do you think that it's a, a key element to uh, push uh, the European system where, towards a, a super league? Because these new investors uh, are more uh, in, in the idea to to um, to make some benefit about uh, 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 after, uh, with with their investment and maybe in selling for for example also their club and if there is a, a super league for some of them but only for some of them probably they will they will make big big benefit uh, in, in in that case. So do you think that uh, it's a key element uh, in the current development and that these uh, uh, new investors are uh, slowly, but next step by step, uh, taking uh, uh, the, the, the power inside the system and conduct us to, to the Super League? Who wants to take this one? Steve, maybe? Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, Didier, thank you for, uh, for your question. Um, so first of all, uh, a very good question, but I would see the, the, the reintroduction of, of TPO or TPI um, in, in the current climate more as um, a real financing solution for, for financial distress in, in, uh, in the football environment. We have many discussions going on, for example, in Belgium, we had a, we had a few of discussions between the, the government around tax regimes that are could be beneficial for, for, for sports clubs in general. And this is, of course, considering the, the financial uh, distress in the world, a, 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 um, a heavy debate these days, um, especially for, for all taxpayers. So to avoid these discussions and to avoid the, uh, the, uh, the heavy discussions in the football permit to, to, to allocate uh, solidarity payments or even just um, just just taxes on, on, on certain transfers or whatever whatever the idea is this could be part of the solution to to help of course smaller clubs um, and of course you need to build in certain certain factors and one could be and this is of course needed uh, for example a maximum of 25 percent of the economic rights could be obtained by a um, by a third party investor and this would have the result that the influence on the club and on the player would be limited, and um, I, this would this would reduce the the, the impact um, of, of those investors in those clubs uh, in the decision making. And also, of course, if you have and this morally relates to your to your part with with respect to the to the breakaway lease, I see this as a completely separate uh, thing. And I think if clubs and if we speak about a super league, we have clubs that have a lot of revenue and that can find and that can get financing by other means so they would not necessarily apply to this regime 
because of course if you have the option to re to retain to maintain 100% of your of the economic rights of your of the player yourself as a club you would choose that option instead of going on to the market for a for a TPI investor and and also to limit the decision from the TPI investor into the club and into football in general it would be a, a, a necessity to to work for example with the, with the licensing um, that the, the TPI investor would have no links at all, for example, by, by Chinese walls, if you like to say it like that, um, with, uh, with the football industry. And this would preserve um, the, the, the healthy or more healthy climate. So I hope this is a, a bit of an answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, we had a comment from Tomislav Globan. Tomislav, do you want to take the floor? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, uh, hi from University of Zagreb. Uh, so just want to comment on what Stefan said about the uh, top clubs not playing uh, each other enough. So what I've read, uh, UEFA is uh, thinking about a change in the system in the Champions League from 2024 in a way that there will be no more eight groups of four teams, but rather one global ranking with 32 teams where the fixtures will be made based on the Swiss system from chess and the Swiss Swiss system in chess is uh, players or rather clubs in football would play with the uh, clubs close to them in the rankings. So when you rise in the rank rankings, you play the top clubs. When you go down in the rankings, you play uh, clubs that are uh, below as well. So that would remedy this problem, which uh, I agree with that we have that uh, nobody wants to see Barcelona playing uh, two games against Berend Svaraj from Hungary and two games from Dinamo Kiev from Ukraine. Uh, they want more games with Juventus, with Bayern, etc. So I think that the threat of having a Super League uh, is not realistic because UEFA with each change in the system, and they change the system every three years, uh, is moving towards uh, this uh, semi-closed uh, league where the big clubs get what they want every time a bit more a bit more and smaller clubs get what they want as well so now we have three competitions from next year so even the champions of small uh, countries like bosnia Her herzegovina or uh, lithuania will have a club in this new conference league so everybody gets uh, a piece of a pie it's a win-win situation so i can envision even more competitions being brought by uefa in the future and promotion relegation between these different tiers of competitions. So I think that the clubs are using the threat of the Super League as a bargaining chip, uh, but I don't see a, a reason to, to break away because UEFA is basically giving them what they want with uh, every, every new uh, reform. Thanks. Thank you, Tomislav. Stefan, I saw that you answered in the, in, in the thread. Yay, Stefan. success. Uh, yes. So, um, okay, I'm boasting now, but uh, that's what Thomas Cohen and I wrote about 20 years ago. That's mm. exactly the system. So let, let this, uh, it, it's really the NFL system. It's how the NFL works. We were just suggesting we, that UEFA should adopt the NFL system. So that's progress. Very good. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else has a, has a question that I may have missed or uh, comments? Kat Katarina, you want to take the floor again? Or is it enough to, to discuss by writing? Maybe Luca, you, you didn't take, you didn't have the opportunity to, to, to talk after your presentation. No, well, it's okay. I just want to comment that um, maybe you should take, in, um, the, there should be the possibility of a rival league. So uh, if, you have the possibility to, to, to enter the market, then it should be not so problematic uh, for an antitrust law point of view or from a competition policy, if, if this new league could be contested by a rival league. And the, the plans for a banner league, I think that they are very promising and this could be an example for other regions, Scandinavia, the Balkans, not just to make markets more larger. Yeah, thank you, Luca. It makes economic sense. 
Are we done with questions, comments? Could I make a remark? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Be my guess. Um, coming back to that remark of Stephen, I agree with him that uh, prices are not the main issue in European competition law. Uh, the point is, you do not even need to know, need to prove that decreased competition leads to higher prices. The law says that any action which leads to decreased competition is illegal. Now, I agree with you, I'm not a legal expert. Um, if it is true that there is another argument, which is, as you said, that the quality of football in the Super League is better than the quality in the present system, then the legal argument is becoming more difficult. That is all that I can say as a non-legal schooler. But so the question is, uh, which of the two leagues is the most interesting? And we then have to take account in my view, because this is what the law proves, is that those threats are illegal. So in principle, the democratic UEFA has the legal power to do what the democracy wants. This is the old European model going back to the social and cultural spheres we discussed. So the question is, if we take measures to restore competitive balance in the present league, and the UEFA could do this if the European law helps it and if the European competition helps it, then the question is, which league is giving higher quality in terms of satisfactions from all fans in Europe? And so, and that is the question. And on one hand, uh, you could say, uh, if big clubs play one another more often, that is nice for the big clubs that will generate more revenues. On the other hand, uh, clubs like PSV and Feyenoord also have fans. And we just heard from, I think, Croatia that it is nice for the small clubs from Croatia to have at least the perspective of playing Barcelona or, or Liverpool one day. So that will add to their pleasure. So, it is very difficult, I think, to determine if the, the problem of competitive balance is solved in a satisfactory way in both league systems, which league system is the best. And then, of course, one idea could have be uh, to have all fans being interviewed and uh, ask them for their opinion. I think that most fans will then say, we do not like the Super League, we like the old traditional system with clubs like Feyenoord and PSV also having a chance of be winning the highest European title once in a hundred years. But of course, we cannot be sure. So that is something which has to be investigated then. We have tried to investigate it in 2004. I, I gave a presentation on a conference in, in Neuchatel. We discussed it and 70% of the Dutch fans was in favor of the present system. We had some later on, it was a preliminary uh, presentation and later on there were some problems with the data. So we have not published it, but some research like that should be done. And if it then shows that people prefer the present system with high competitive balance to the Super League system, then the Super League system is illegal because then the fact that it reduces competition, that it's a model to increase the market power of the participants will be very important for the European court. So the, main, the remaining question, as far as I as a non-legal schooler can see, the only remaining question is which league system is most attractive? And to be honest, as a scientist, we cannot be sure because no research has been done on that issue. Thank you, Chelly. Any comment from what Ch Chelly said? Yeah, Stefan, maybe? Yeah, sorry. Um, I, so one of the things, I, I posted the, uh, the law, the, the text of the law in the, in the chat because mm -hmm. I think people, when we talk about competition law, we have to be based on what it actually says. And I think what Charlie was just saying is not quite right. The, the, the law, is, the Article 101 is quite complicated, it, but it basically says that any agreement amongst enterprises which uh, restrict or distort competition, prevent, restrict or distort competition are illegal. Uh, would a Super League prevent, restrict or distort competition? Well, 
here's the here's the point. What they're going to say is we're going to enable big clubs to compete with each other more often, which is creating a competition which is attractive to consumers. And if that means that there's a little bit less competition amongst between big clubs and small clubs, which doesn't generate very much attention, that's that's not a prevention of distortion of competition. It's just competition by different means. And um, the uh, I think one of the things I think everyone here often likes to say that the problem at the moment is that the small clubs don't have a chance in European competition. And when you say that, you're actually playing into the hands of a potential Super League, because that's exactly what they're going to say. They're going to say, well, it doesn't matter. These small clubs never had a chance anyway, so we're not really taking very much away from you. Um, and, and I think, you know, you need to recognize how this would be turned against you if, if this ever came to a legal, to a legal argument. Sean, you, you, you raised your hand. Please be short. Question for Stefan. Stefan, one of the criticisms of FFP is that it locks in the existing order, the, the dominant order. I mean, I'm a fan of FFP, but I think it's an interesting argument. But surely a Super League now does exactly the same thing. It'll be dominated by clubs from four countries. You know, I mean, what about the whole of Eastern Europe, Southern Europe? I mean, I mean, surely a Super League would lock in the, the existing order much more aggressively than FFP allegedly does. Yeah, that, that that's that's a, that's a, something that is really, I would say that increase the risk of uh, seeing a Super League being developed because it, it wouldn't change much the, the sporting results and the sporting winners. So, yeah, that's something that is um, worrying, to you say would, the least. You would be watching teams from Italy, Spain, England and Germany and maybe PSG. So that, that's a Super League. It's, it's actually, it's not a European Super League. It's a four and a half big economy league. Yeah, because that, that's considering that PSG is the French club and that that's debatable. The money doesn't come from French, France. The players are mostly not French. The fans are French, but maybe not all of them. In the, in the, in the stadium, yes, but on TV, less and less fans are French. So, yeah, that's debatable. So much younger than the Champions League. Well, the debate could, could be longer, and uh, hopefully it's going to be it's going to take place some other day, because um, I'm I'm going to close the the debate the, the, the seminar today because we want to we want to be strict on time. Uh, I want to thank you all of you a lot. Uh, there's 37 people left at the end of the webinar, but we were more more in the morning. That happens. Um, remind you that this uh, this webinar is going to be is, has been recorded, and that the record things is going to be available maybe next week if you want to look at look at it again if you want to circulate it do it this is again a first step in our project of building a new regulation for sport we saw that we all pretty much disagree on everything but that's that's good to talk <laughs> it's really good to talk and to realize but still we're, we're going to approach you for uh, during the, the next steps uh, maybe we're going to make shorter webinars maybe we're going to make other, we're going to have other ideas and hopefully one day we're going to meet again <laughs> live <laughs> physically uh, but very very happy to have you uh, have talked to you today i really think the debate was really interesting and this uh, pluridisciplinarity is very something that CDS is interested in. The fact that we are not only among economists is really, really fruitful, I think. So uh, hopefully in the future, we, get, we manage to gather people from other fields that are not here today. Uh, thank you all. Um, I'm not going to be longer. Um, hope you liked it. And um, yeah, see, see you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.